Aragon lifted Glader's Eldunari over his head, presenting it to the sun and the new day, and he smiled, eager for the battles yet to come so that he and Sephira might finally confront Galbatorix and kill the Dark King. That was a long sentence. <laughs> that was a great way to start the show. Welcome in, everybody. What's up, Internet? My name's Nerdy. And I'm Claro. And this is The Nerdy. The Wordy. The Book Club. This is our, I don't know what episode, but this is our third episode of the <laughs> Inheritance Cycle. This one is called Brissinger. <laughs> Did the sword light on fire? Uh, it's in the other room. So Wait, we, don't, we have Brissinger. Why don't we have it in the room? I... I, I don't know. It's hanging on the didn't wall. Didn't think ahead. Didn't think ahead. Uh, that's right. This year for her birthday, I did buy um, uh, you Brissinger as a gift. Yes. I now own Brissinger. Uh, it's not made out of bright steel, unfortunately, but yes, it uh, is. it's pretty cute. I went to the Minoa tree and I was like, look. Then why is not the blade blue? Uh, because I don't have magic. Exactly. <laughs> Shut up. Uh, this is, um, a very good book. It's a great book. It's a great book. Good morning, chat. Welcome on in. We're so excited. Yeah. We're excited for a few reasons. A few reasons. You know, Alec, welcome back to the nerd table. <laughs> Alec says, still have 10 hours to go and the books keep getting longer. True. That's true. In fact, did you know that the last two books were meant to be one? Yeah. Did you know that part of the reason why, um, they aren't one book is because he decided not to kill Sloane? Mid-writing. Oh, that's the reason? Yeah. Uh, so the, he, the original plan that was that he killed that Sloan. Time. Uh, it added uh, over 100 pages to the book. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. He said that himself. In the, the post-interview, the, the on, on the audiobook, there's an mm. interview with Christopher Paolini. Should have listened to that. I, this, I forgot about it, This honest. is the first time I've listened to an audiobook in my life. Ever? A full audio. That, this, I, this is the first time I've sat down and listened to an entire audiobook. We listen to chunks of Eldest. Yes. Um, but this is the first time I've ever listened to a, an audiobook from be beginning to end. Wow. And I gotta say, my name is Sephira and I'm a dragon. <laughs> Aragon, why are you with the two legs? Uh, my name's Glader and I'm also a dragon. My name's Sephira. Sometimes when we're talking to each other, it gets very confusing. It's pretty great. It's pretty great. Uh, if you haven't listened to the audiobooks, uh, do it because uh, it's worth it just for um, Hilarious. the dragon voices. They grow um, on me. I'm not going to lie. I don't. Right? Um, you get over it. Like I don't mind it as much anymore. Yeah. It yeah. was st the first time you heard it, we were in the car and David looks over to me. He's like, is that Sephira? <laughs> I, I just about lost it. The only, yeah. the only time it doesn't work for me, honestly, now... Um, is when Glader and Sephira are talking to each other. Yeah. It can be really hard to figure out who's speaking. Yeah, it's hard to d distinguish the voices when it's just kind of gravel. Well, and there's there's a point where Glader uses the word little one. Yeah. And I was like, wait, what what is happening? Yeah. Um. So so, but other other than like those minor things, I the the dragon voices is really like I got over it very fast. Uh, it was just that first time here in Sphere that I was like, Why? It was a Why? shock. It's a sh Yeah, yeah. People, yeah. There are a lot of people who hate it. <laughs> I'm curious to listen to the audiobook uh, for Murtag, because they brought back the same guy who yes. narrated Aragon, uh, the series, and I wonder if he did the same voice for Thorn, now that Thorn is an uh, adult. So, Dragon. if you didn't know, a uh, little, little, oh, little by the way, drop today. Christopher Paulini fans, today's a gift. It's a gift. Uh, and the gift is this chonky book yeah yeah it's, she's thick she i mean look it's like the same oh but yeah but this like book same. is eight hours look longer how yellow this is compared to but the, the the weird thing is these are like the same width uh-huh uh almost and this is eight this hours longer in the audiobook this one's a little chunkier i feel like is the text the same like or maybe not size? maybe it's five hours longer it looks uh, like the pretty same similar. yeah all right there are some pictures in this though oh Ooh, that's fun. Yeah, this like copy of Murtag, like it gives you like that's Gilead. Ah, uh, okay, cool, 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 cool. Yeah, that's fun, right? 
great, great podcast content. Yeah, yeah. Look at these pictures inside of a book. Yeah, don't worry about it. Uh, the, yeah, this this guy is old and like lived there in, might be spoilers. Lived in a in basement photos, so. for um, like five years, so don't mind the uh, yellowed page. Um, Murtag is out. Um, this is not a sponsor thing. Uh, we are not sponsored by this book. Um, however, we are very excited to uh, go see. Christopher Paolini talk about this mm-hmm. um, on, Thursday. on Thursday. He's going to be here in Toronto. So we were like, oh, hell yeah, we're going to go get our book signed. So if you're like, wow, you're going to meet Paolini and you're like, you you have a question that you are absolutely just dying to ask him, uh, drop it in the Discord. We'll see if we can. Yeah, we'll see if we can't get Christopher Paolini questions. to answer some questions. Yeah, it'll be fun. Like, how dare he? Like, what did the Manoa tree take from Aragon? We need to know. What What is Angela? What is Angela? I was like, I wonder if she's like a descendant of the Grey Folk. But they're so old that like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Sylvia Dragoness says they're one of those people who hate it. I think they mean the, the voice. dragon voices. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, Which so before we get into the, uh, the discussion on a book that I very much love, mm-hmm. I think this is the... Best book in the series so far. Mm-hmm. Uh, I haven't read... I've only read Inheritance once, and it was the weekend that it came out. Yeah. So it's been <coughs> 12 years for me. Hot um, moment. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember what happens to Murtag. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we have some housekeeping we got to get into before we talk about a book that I have no complaints on. I, mm-hmm. I think everything about this book is great. Um, and uh, that's going to start with the fact that today we are sponsored. We are brought to you by Misty Mountain Gaming. What? Misty Mountain Gaming is a dice company that makes dice. They also make other things, but let's be honest. You're there for the dice. Who gives a shit? You're you're there for the dice. The leather bags, are they great? Yes. Are they well made? Of course. Should you buy one? Probably. I have one and I use it because it is fantastic. Mm -hmm. But is that why I am at MistyMountainGaming.com? No, it is because they've got the shiny math rocks. Yeah. The the, the candy that cannot be eaten. And I love it. It's, uh, yeah, it's pretty great. If you're like, oh, I like shiny things, uh, Miss Mountain Gaming has got lots of shiny things. Do you want to own dice? They, 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 they play with knuckle bones in this series. Uh-huh. Do you want to own dice made of actual bone? Oh, that's true. They have that. Equi- or ec- No, not equitably sourced. Ethically sourced. Ethically sourced bone? Equitably sourced. Do you want equitably sourced bone dice? They got that at MissyMountainGaming.com. If you go over there, you can use code NerdyNightly15 and get 15% off your order thanks to... This old guy right here and this old guy right there. Uh, we are we're getting you a deal, chat. Yeah. And that deal is fifteen percent off. You're welcome. If you use Nerdy Nightly fifteen at MissyMountainGaming.com. You'll love to see it. Kenny Theology, thank you for being a member. Welcome back to the for Nerd Table. Months. How many letters did Matt write in that other series? Uh, wh- which other? A series? singular, a singular letter. It's fine. We're He's gonna, talking we're, about the Wheel of Time. We're, we're gonna we're gonna talk to Brandon Sanderson one day. It's gonna happen. It's oh, gonna happen. And we're gonna ask about that, and he's going to have no answer. All we're gonna care about is the letters. He's gonna be like, "What fucking letters are you even talking about? Like, why the fuck do you care?" He's gonna be like, "Get a life." Uh, no, he's going. To, he's literally not going to have an answer to that question. Yeah, he's gonna be like, "Why? Why are letters? you asking me about? Why does this matter?" We're like, "Because we need to know." I wanna know, Brandon Sando. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Well done. Well done. <sighs> but we're here to talk about the inheritance cycle today, not Wheel of Time. Brisinger. Brisinger. Br- Brisinger. Mm-hmm. I feel like it'd be really annoying to have a sword that like burst into flame if I was accidentally like talking about my sword. Yeah. yeah. Useful. It it is hilarious how quickly he realizes that it's a problem. Yeah. Too. Like it's not even. Like... He's like, wow, cool, and then he's like, oh fuck. <laughs> well, and then, yeah. In in the final fight, he's like, wait, I don't want to light my sword up all the time. This is a nightmare. Yeah. My sword has become a living nightmare. Yeah. Especially if you're, like, trying to be stealthy. Yeah. Or, like. Well, and Brisinger is his favorite spell. So, like, it, it's it's like if Harry Potter, every time he said Expelliarmus, his, like, wand blew up. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like. It just let off a siren. It's like, no, this is the only thing I do. It's like, wee-oo, wee-oo, here I am. <laughs> Come find me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely an inconvenience, but a really, really cool inconvenience. I'm not gonna lie. Um, but, uh, he doesn't have that yet. So let's go back to the top of the story. Um. <laughs> it does take from his energy. Hopefully he doesn't say Brisinger and then accidentally pass out. Or die. Well, that's what I mean. If he passes out, he can't end the spell, so. <laughs> 
It's fine. I'm sure it doesn't huh. matter. I feel like some spells would just end when you pass out and stop feeding them energy, though. Uh, well, not the one that uh, he had on Thorn and Murtag, right? Yeah. In the, in the battle, they fly away, and the, like Arya has like wakes him up, and she's like, "End the spell! You're gonna kill us." We're not there yet. Sorry. The beginning of Brissinger. Mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna talk about this in sections. Um, not really chapter by chapter, because there's like 80 chapters. Um, yeah. But uh, we're going to start at the top of the book, which uh, starts about three days after the end of Eldest. Mm -hmm. um, everyone's licking their uh, wounds after the victory, but also defeat at the hands of Murtag. Yeah. Uh, the dwarves, very upset. Very upset. Hrothgar is dead. Very upset. Rothgar yeah. has been killed, slain, yeah. by Murtag. laid to waste, uh, and entombed in stone again. Uh, it has been three days, and in those three days, a lot happened. Uh, the I, One thing yeah. I like about the Paolini books, because I have peaked at the beginning of Inheritance, um, ah, okay. is that they, they always do start with a big fight. Yeah. Uh, and it's... The, he... Even even Aragon, it starts with Arya and Durza, right? Yeah, it's it always starts with like a hook in Th mm -hmm. this one a little bit less. So it takes a couple of chapters to get into the Rizak actual fight of it, but it doesn't but you start know what they're with. Doing. It doesn't start at Aragon, and, and this is this is something that I want the streaming series on all the streamers, not just Disney Plus, but all of them. Um, when they do return from the strike and when the AMPTP pulls its head out of its ass and stops trying to steal our likenesses for AI yeah. for $100. That'd be nice. Because um, that's why the strike is still going on from yesterday's because they they want to own our faces after we die. Um, they want yep. There's literally a zombie clause. Uh, it's yep. dark. Anyway, uh, I, I like and I think that streaming shows need to pull this, is that you start the book at the inciting incident. Yeah, and then you backtrack a little bit. Not No backtrack. You start, Sorry, and then you like the wrong feed in a little bit of information about how we got here. Okay, sure. But I don't need full flashbacks to them talking about doing a thing that right. we can just see them do. Right. I understand that that conversation happened, and I buy it when Aragon says, I had to convince Nasawada, and she agreed. Right. That's all I need. Yeah. Start at the story starting. I believe you. And I think that, like, it's a really basic thing, mm -hmm. but it's something that modern writers, I think, take for granted. Mm -hmm. we, we try and, like, elongate the beginning of stories for some reason, mm -hmm. and it is always a bad idea. It is never interesting to tell the prequel to where your story begins at the beginning of your story. Just mm -hmm. start where the inciting incident happens. It is the I've, most simple thing. Yeah, I've put down books and never picked them up again because, yeah. like, it just, it, it's too slow of an introduction. And some people talk about, like, certain series that they love and the whole book, the first whole first book is kind of slow. And I'm like, why the fuck did you buy the second one? Yeah. But uh, that's just me, and I have no time. Because um, we got no time. So we start, uh, and Aragon and uh, Murtag are leaning on a little hillside, looking up at Hellgrind. We're just already there. Yeah. And they're trying to figure out how they're going to get into the Rizak's lair when, out of the distance, uh, Palanquin is dragged. That's the right word, right? Isn't that Palanquin the thing when you carry someone on a thing? Yeah, is that how you pronounce it? I, I don't know. Uh, Alakin is, is, is well, carried up to a little um, a little plateau. Yeah. And we get... Horror. Oh, wait, this series is a horror series. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and it is. Like, I don't know if you remember a certain thing in Inheritance, but, like, it, it there there's... Yeah, there's some horrifying elements of this. The, the scene with the... scene with the, the Where they're chained. Huh? Nezuada? Oh no! I'm thinking yeah, of. Okay. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of Aragon and Arya. Nope. Uh, no. There's two big horror movements. Then oh, you're talking about the yeah 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 yeah. Yeah, spoilers for next week. We'll talk about. Sorry, it next Breezy. Week. I do mean Roran, not Murtag. Thank you. <laughs> Roran and Aragon. I keep looking at the word Murtag. He's it's right sick. here. He He's looks right so there. cute. Look at He's him. Staring up at us. Look at him. <laughs> that little monster. Yeah. Um. So uh, yeah, there the 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 we get sort of this introduction to the darker world of Allegasia, I think, for the first time in a way that Aragon and Eldest allude to, but don't really lean into as much. Mm -hmm. And I think that on top of this being uh, my favorite book in the series, uh, this is where I feel like Christopher Paolini's writing becomes adult writing. Yeah. 
in a way that I, I think his prose levels up in a huge way. Yeah. I think his um, narrative structure is really strong. Mm -hmm. I think the way that he passes momentum between Roran, Aragon, and Nasuada's POV chapters is really impeccable in this book. Yeah. I, I think, like, th this, this is the first book that I think really has a... Um, sure-footed sense of momentum from beginning to end mm -hmm. that I, I was just so genuinely impressed by rereading it as an adult. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, one of one of my favorite parts that I mentioned in, like, book club number one was um, growing up with Christopher Paolini's writing while he's growing up. Like, like, yeah. um, there's, a, there's a, there's, like, you know, a certain, like, section of, like, ages I guess um of people who like you know started El uh, Aragon as like yeah, teenager or you know 10 11 12 even like and uh, as they got older and read more of the books like the books matured with them yeah um, and I think that like for for those of us who that's the case they they hold a special place in in our heart because like that's an incredibly unique experience mm -hmm. writers change and grow and get better or get worse but like um mostly like get better over time but not necessarily because they started at like age 14 right like they're they're like there's so much worldview shifting that happens i think from age like 13 to like 18 even yeah. or like 20 um that that is is captured really well in this series um because brissinger feels very adult um it, it there is there is a distinct shift from this to aragon and even to eldest um and i i think that that shift even continues into inheritance it has been a while since i've read inheritance but like um that's just from what i remember yeah yeah, it's uh, it's 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 delightful. It's really really interesting to to witness. Uh, Astra and Amy says, to be fair, I find battles really dull, so I appreciate build up more unless the inciting incident is in a battle. I, I'm not saying that you always have to start at a battle because mm -hmm. most things that I watch and read don't have any fighting in them, right? Um, not on the channel as much. It's harder to react to that stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, I just mean start where the story gets interesting. Yeah. And not when your characters are talking about the story may be getting interesting soon. Yeah. Um, uh, a what a do fam says, your wife single? I don't know that's if that's how wife works. I mean, kind of. Is my wife single? Well, you're not single, but like, you know. I'm not single. If you're really hot. If you have, like, mommy milkers, I'm, I'm taking applications. That's all I'm saying. It's, uh, that's, all, that's, that's all I'm saying. You can uh, reach me at my email, clarispolaris at gmail.com. Uh, anyways. But only if you have mommy milkers. Yeah, yeah. I like them to We only babies. take sponsorships from I sponsors who have mommy milkers. My titties beanies. <laughs> <laughs> So we see the palanquin cl coming up the uh, hillside, mm -hmm. and on it is a uh, person, kind of. Uh, a torso. A torso. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It's it's horrifying. Yeah. The, 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 the Razak and the religion of the priests of Helgrind is so fucked up. Um, so basically, basically, the priests of Helgrind believe that the less appendages you have on your body... Uh, the closer you are to God, Satan, Razak, wh whatever they, exactly they worship, um, they, they believe you will have a less connection to this mortal plane, however you want to say that. Yeah. So I have a question. Who was the first person to cut off the wiener? Torsk. Yeah, oh, okay. I don't know if any of them would cut that off. It's an appendage. I don't know that you... Hmm. Right? With magic, I guess you could heal it and not die. And a lot of the priests of Hellgrind can use magic. Yeah. Probably Torsk. Probably. Is that a spoiler? I, did they mention Torsk in this book? No. Sorry. Torsk is a name. It's a name. It doesn't matter. It does. It really does. It really doesn't. It, it does not matter. It's a spoiler of a thing that a character goes, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> not a spoiler. Um, I, I just, I, I sometimes find that it is very hard to write fictional religions without leaning heavily on real world religions. Okay. And I thought that this was a really interesting 
fictional religion that I don't see the like real world inspiration for very directly. So it just it felt it felt like creepy and weird in a way that felt very alien, yes. which made it I think stronger in my opinion, right? I think that this opening has a really sinister vibe mm-hmm. that I I was really enamored with. Yeah, in a dark way. <laughs> oh, 100% in a dark way, but I I like horror. You know what yeah. I mean? Like I'm a big I'm a big horror movie fan. Yeah. And so I it, it, going back to uh, when we were doing Wheel of Time on the show, mm-hmm. the horror scenes are some of my favorite stuff, right? Like yeah. um So Harbor to this day, I don't like that it didn't really go anywhere, but the setup of it and mm-hmm. the cr- the way in which Robert Jordan wrote the like creep factor of that, I, I I've been enamored with since we read it. Yeah. Um the 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 whole scenario in freaking um whatever that town is. Uh Wait, I don't know. Wait, what I happens? can't remember what it's called. Uh, so I don't know if or... I want to spoil it because. No, yeah, do, we don't need to talk about Wheel of Time stuff. This in isn't case Wheel of Time. But, people but are, haven't read it. I love horror stuff. I just yeah. do. I, I I've always loved horror. I've always been enamored with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when this book starts out with this like horror scene, this hills have eyes bullshit. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, honestly. I, I I'm it, I immediately sit forward in my seat and I'm like, oh, we're we're off to a, we're off to the races. And like the frenzy of it. Yeah. Right. Like like. These people are like so excited to watch this guy cut off his hand and well, be like, "Oh God!" And while I can't understand doing it, right? I really can't. Yeah, I can understand being there and getting caught up in it. The mob mentality. I like I because I've been in those crowds. Granted, I've usually been on drugs, but I've been in those crowds where something crazy is happening. And you just lose it as a unit. Mm -hmm. And it's like so exciting. It's like going to a sports game Mm -hmm. that you don't understand. And there's something, well, when we, when I took you to the Buffalo Bills game, right? Like, even though you don't get football and you don't like, you wouldn't go out of your way to watch football. When the Bills scored their, like, when the opening touchdown happened and the 50,000 people are having that, like, vibrational energy pass through them, Mm -hmm. there's just something, there's something to that that you can't replicate in any other way. There's something to the energy of a crowd of people that I just don't think, like, exists artificially. It's something I don't think AI could ever generate, right? Yeah, because yeah, it is just no. this. It is just this like in, intense human experience to feel other people's excitement so viscerally. Yeah, yeah, and it's why people get swept up into doing things that they wouldn't normally do. Mm-hmm. Um, that yeah, that like frenzy. I mean, I think the like probably most common example in like literature it might be like Lord of the Flies because I know a lot of people I had studied in school a lot of people do yeah but that like that that a like a book that is I want to be very clear a uh, full on lie yeah crazy <laughs> that right? is not what happened to those boys I know it's they so were wild. very ordered and they took care of each other yeah yeah <laughs> it's strange right but that book is a hundred percent fictional <laughs> yes yes but the idea of it isn't because we've seen it happen right when like mobs get together oh, yeah. and, and like uh, yeah getting swept up in that frenzy of it and so like witnessing that in this like <clears throat> really <throat> horrific scene where this guy's like yeah I'm gonna cut off my hand and everyone's like woo and they're like drinking this guy's blood and it's like yeah it's a whole thing and Aragon's like why the fuck would you cut off your hand mm-hmm. you could you lose that anytime you know fair so many people like get injured in a world like this well, in where... their world <laughs> they're at war <laughs> yeah <laughs> they're watching people lose limbs yep. literally people daily. are losing limbs Left, right, and center. They, uh, the, the hell grind priests leave some, uh, slaves to be eaten by the Razak because the shit's dark. And they, uh, leave for the day. Uh, Aragon and Rorin go back to Sephira and come up with a plan to attack at dawn when the Razak are at their weakest. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Razak will be with their leather blaka, Mm -hmm. their parents, who are also their (laughs) magic school buses. If you missed last week's uh, book club, you have no idea why that is I just, funny. I can't imagine getting old and my kids are like, all right, you're 25 now, dad. It's time for me to ride you. You are going to ferry me around. Actually, no, pe- pa- parents drive their kids everywhere. I know people who, whose parents literally ferry them around. Yeah. So it's not that different. 
Uh, and so they 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 leave it dawn, and mm. as they're fleeing, uh, they're as they leave it dawn, uh, they go to attack, and they look down at the cages the slaves had been in. They're empty, meaning the Razak are here, and we're headed into a fight, boys. Yep, yeah. It's time, uh, and the Lady Sephira. Uh, wh- what did you think of the way in which they found their way into the Razak's lair? The accidental, just like, oh, oh, the secret door? No, it starts with the flower, right? Yeah, 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 sure. Because they're like, wait, that flower can't be there. Well, and Aragon's like, I can't feel their consciousness. Like, Mm, that is really suspicious. Like, where are they hiding? Which, which, I will say, hey, Brom, Daddy Brom, you and Aragon travel in the countryside to hunt Razak down. You're teaching your son a few words. Sorry, spoilers for later in the book. You're teaching your son a few words in the ancient language. You're Mm. like, this is what magic is. You got to defend... You By were the way, those, those creatures the were hunting? Razak. Yeah. And you you failed to mention to your son. Do you think that this was Christopher Paolini realizing that Brom not sensing th- th- that them sneaking up on Brom was like a little bit convenient? And so he added this in later? Because this is not mentioned until book three. Um, and the Razak are from chapter four. So here's the thing. Brom did not really teach Aragon that he could like sense everything around him and like reach out with his consciousness in the way like he was like he was like you 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 can because uh Aragon mentions that um he like calms down Kadok by touching his mind to to the horse's mind to calm him and Brahm is like mm, you shouldn't be able to do that and so mm, I tr- I honestly true. I think that Brahm just is like this is not important right now. Like memor like t- like memorizing spells and ways to like protect yourself is more important than like oh yeah, by the way, the you can't feel their minds. Like it just it could be a like a kind of retcon thing, yeah. but you can justify like with the events that happened that he didn't deem it important because cool, cool, cool. like there was no way Aragon, like, he was like, Aragon's not, I'm not teaching him to, what what Oromus teaches teaches him about being aware of his surroundings all the time. Interesting that so you bring up Oromus. Not that point, yeah. Because my second question is, hey, Oromus, third father figure to Aragon, uh-huh. uh, you knew that he uh, was hunting and uh, fighting against the Razak, and you didn't tell Aragon... <laughs> The number of people that don't tell Aragon that you cannot uh, feel the Razak's minds. Yeah. This is a series where the main character is regularly in mortal danger mm-hmm. because people just leave information out that they have access to. Now, here's a question. And that he luckily survives. Here's a question. <laughs> do you think that the Razak naturally, their consciousness can't be felt? Yes. Or do you think that Galbatorix, like put a spell on them, and that's why nobody knows that you can't feel their consciousness. No, I, I think that I think that them being, like, the bane of the riders, I, I think that them being... I mean, the, the riders destroyed all of them, I, except I for two. I think that if Galbatorix could do that, he would do it to everyone. Why? Because why would you just do it to the Razak? Why not do that to Murtag? Why not do that to all of your spellcasters? Well, Why not because, do it to... because Galbatorix needs to be able to get into Murtag's mind. So if yeah, Galbatorix... He can just, if, he, if, if you can make that spell, he can give himself permission, right? Uh, maybe. I just think it's more maybe. interesting if it is their, like... If it's like they, they, that's how they evolved to defend themselves against the dragons. Yeah. Like the Rizaks, like, um, what, what is the word? The, the, their, what? Their... there's a word for like evolutionary reasons for something. Oh. Um, but, but, but I, I don't know. I, I think that if it's just another of Galbatorix's things, it makes the Rizak less interesting. And so I don't like it. Okay. Fair. I like, I like to like l- allow other things to be more powerful than just the one big bad guy. Sure. And I think that this series does that with the Razak. I think it does that with the thing from the next book that you you were talking about. Yeah. I think that like th- there, there are, is power outside of Galbatorix in this world. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm good with that. I don't need everything to come from sort of like the dark one in real time. I don't need all evil to come from one source. Mm-hmm. It is interesting to have there be things that are just as dangerous as Galbatorx in the world, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking there might be one in Murtag, out in th- not a sponsor, but I have this beautiful book in my hands and uh, it's out now. Um, yes, it's pretty beautiful. Yeah. 
Hi, Shin. How's it going? What's so, up, Chad? So, uh, Breezy says Aragon is Brom's son. Ah, <laughs> uh, Breezy. Breezy. If, if you, have, so if you this haven't is, read this book. This is the book Brissinger that we're talking about. We will be talking full spoilers for Brissinger. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry to spoil the book that we're talking about for you. We're not sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yes, yeah, Sephira, like, boops her head into the Razak's lair. And they walk through this illusion. Yeah, her, like, wing accidentally, like, brushes a wall that's not there. And they're like, did you see that? Because there's, like, a flower, like, growing out of the rock. And Aragorn's like, that's suspicious. How, I, did, how does the sun reach that flower? Yeah, it turns out. It's an indoor. illusion. Hidden door. And then I mean, the fighting door. begins. It's just an entrance. Oh, yeah, they literally enter the cave, and it's it's a fight immediately. It's on, like, Donkey Kong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And yeah. it's... A good fight. Good fight. I, I like the um I like the faith that they show Aragon has in Roran's ability really quickly. Cause they get off Sephira a little bit hard and it sucks, but they get up and they're fighting the Razak while Sephira's handling the leather blocka. Mm -hmm. And you just Aragon boops behind Roran and is trying to cast spells and has faith that Roran with a hammer will be able to fend off two swords. And a lot of wards. And a lot of wards. And, and a lot, lot of, wards. of wards. Like, let's be very clear. You know, a couple a couple stabs get past the wards, but, like, yeah. the, the the magical shields come in very handy in a circumstance In the whole like series. This. Yeah. Uh, and so I... So when Roran doesn't have them. Yeah, and then he gets blown to holy hell. I mean, yeah, he gets shot in the back and nearly dies. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Um, yeah. Uh, Roran's alive. Don't worry about Roran it. Roran goes through some shit. Mm -hmm. Um... No, but I, I just, I really like the, because Aragon and Roran haven't f ever fought together. Mm -hmm. And so you get this like sibling-esque moment of the kind of faith that I don't think Aragon could show in another person he hasn't fought beside. Yeah. But he can like, show it like in Roran because it's... and Arya and that's But it. Arya, Arya is because of, she's proven herself to him. Right. As a combatant, mm -hmm. right? She's a better combatant than him. Mm-hmm. With Roran, it's they have never fought side by side. Mm -hmm. He's he saw Roran take down the twins, kind of, but that wasn't really a fight. They were distracted, and he just murdered them. Um, this is this is the kind of faith that you see in two people who grew up knowing each other their whole lives. Yeah, and I thought that uh, Christopher Paolini captured that relationship really well in this moment. And yeah, the faith that they have in each other is so immediate, mm -hmm. even though they've been apart for the first two books of the series mostly. Yeah, and the and the the responsibility that Aragon shoulders shortly after when uh, they find he finds Sloan yeah. in uh, in in Hellgrind. They do kill one of the Razak. Yep. Um, <clears throat> And then, uh... Sephira the... just fucking murks the leather blocka. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Kills one of them, shakes it like a fucking rabbit. Polar and then, <laughs> And then, like, tumbles out the door with the other one and just, like, leaves it dead in the lake outside. <laughs> yeah, and so they, they go down and uh, they they find Katrina. She is alive. She's not well, but she's alive. Yeah. Uh, and Aragon sees Sloane in a cell. Uh-huh. And... Doesn't know what to do, so just puts him to sleep. Yeah. Goes back. They put Aragon and uh, Ro sorry, they put Roran and Katrina up on Sphera. Aragon tells Roran that Sloane is dead. Yeah. And then Roran tells Katrina, but yeah, he he says. I that don't Sloane remember is dead. if that comes back in Inheritance. I don't remember what happens with that. Yeah. Um. Fun. And so yeah, the, the, and this is where this book goes from being a fun beginning to oh, this is a good book to me. Yeah. Like the the what happens here. First, Aragon goes and hunts down the last Razak. Yes. And they have a very... I, I love the beat of the Razak standing before Aragon before they fight, mm -hmm. going, oh, fuck, I'm going to die. Will you just tell your people of me? Will you, like, will you... He tries to make this deal where he's like, just... Can you make sure that people remember that my kind existed and that, and that you we were, were the scared fear of, of us? Yeah, yeah that, that we were the the thing that goes bump in the night. Yeah, and yeah. Aragon goes no. Yeah, well, because the he was like, why would I do that? And the Razak is like, well, I'm gonna tell you something. And Aragon's like, okay, well, tell me it first, and I'll let you know if it's worth that. And the Razak is like, he's looking for the name. And Aragon's like, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. No deal. Yes, he does though. Aragon does not. Does not know what he's talking about. Has no idea at this point what Galbatorix is searching for. 
Yeah, it's in Eldest is the first time it's brought up. That he's searching for the name of the no. ancient language. Yeah. No. Nobody knows why Galbatorix has shut himself away. Now, the elves are like, hey, so he definitely, like, is breaking all the Eldunari so that they serve him. But now, like, now we don't know why he's still I secluded. I think there's a mention of it in Eldest. They mention... That he's looking the for the name of the ancient no, language. They do not mention that Galbatorix is looking for that name. But Aragorn does ask at some point, like, what if you knew the name of the language? And Ormus is like, well, then you'd have a lot of fucking power. because. But nobody knows that. It's been lost. It, you know, you can't find hmm. it. I do not I, believe it's ever brought up that... I don't know that that's true. I, I, I remember something in Eldest about that. So I... I, I'm 99.9% sure that, uh, no. Now I have to reread Eldest and find it. You're going to um, have to find it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sh Shafika Idris says someone mentioned he was looking for something, but I can't remember the details. Yeah, okay. there, there is, th no one Maybe is... Maybe it says Galbatorx is looking for something, and I filled in the ancient name of the ancient language. Yeah, which, because, obviously, that's, yeah. Um, interesting. Because it makes sense. So, uh, yeah, so he... The Rezek is like, he's looking for the name, and Aragon's like, I don't know what the fuck that means, so no, we sure don't do. have a deal. <laughs> no, no one will remember you. Yeah. And then the Rezek... Except for the people who call Grind. The Rezek curses him that he will leave Elegazia forever. Yeah. Spicy. It's almost like... Prophecy. That's been prophesized and cursed <laughs> twice now. Uh, yeah, because it happens again later it's in such a book. It's such a weirdly specific thing to curse on somebody like it would be like if someone was like nerdy i curse you so that you may never again be in canada and i'd be like okay it's sort of a weird yeah. thing to curse like, me that's with. strange <laughs> but uh thanks again well and it, the, what's so strange about it to, in my opinion is that like there is other there are other places on the planet that are apparently like good not really. The only place that we know of is I mean, where the elves and the humans came from. And they, like, fled from there. Oh, that's true, yeah, yeah. We don't actually know what happened. So. Yeah. Uh, Joe Berlin says, it's sort of mean that the Rizak doesn't get its deal just because Aragon is, Ar Ar Aragon is too stupid to get it. Um, I, d I don't know. I disagree. I think that uh, if you are, like, I have information... And then that and then information you give, like, is a, a weird riddle. riddle. I'd be like, well, fuck well, off. That's not information. Now, to be fair, I don't want a puzzle. I want the answer. Yeah, obviously, the Razak were sworn to oaths that they couldn't like talk about it mm -hmm. directly. So it's not really his fault, but he tried. Yeah, he tried. Yeah, he tried. <laughs> he tried. So Aragon uh, uh, does not get on Sephira with Katrina and Roran, and he runs back into a tunnel, and Sephira freaks the fuck out because yeah. she's like, "You fucking." You dumb little... Every time you leave me, bad shit happens. And Aragorn's like, I know. Go home. I'll be there later. It's all good. I just have to go deal with Sloane. Don't tell Katrina and Roran. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Don't turn around and look at them while you're flying. Because I don't, they're going to just be making out. It's going to be gross. I don't have a plan, but I'm going to stay anyways. Roran has never kissed a woman with a beard before. And he's not going to know what he's doing. It's going to be real weird. Not that. It's a skill set. Okay, sure. I'll take your word for it's it. It's a skill set. I've never had yeah. a beard. As a bearded man, mm -hmm. it's a skill set. Sure, if you say so. I'm sure, it's very different. But it, it, you know what? It is. <laughs> I honestly look that moment. That moment gets me mm -hmm. when Safira is like almost like crying. She's like, "Don't no, like I can't just like leave you here." And he's like, "Oh, go, go. It's gonna be fine. You have to get Roran and Katrina to safety." Because like Katrina, not well. Um, so yeah, I, I agree that, that one, that one, that one gets me. It gets it's me good. all choked up. Yeah. And then we get like, I, I think one of the more interesting elements of the whole series is. Yeah. Where Aragon tries to figure out what the hell to do with Sloane. Yeah. Because Sloane is a murderer mm -hmm. who betrayed Carvajal. Yeah. And yet Aragon is like, I'm not old or wise enough to take away someone's life when I am have it in my hands. Like I am not a maker or passer of laws. Like, I, yeah. I fight in combat. I'm 17. <laughs> I mean... 16, there's still time for you. Yeah. I think he's literally, like, almost 17. I think he's... seven. I, you know what? I... 
I never know his how much time birthday, has passed. His birthday happens in Aragon. His he turns 16th. 16, yeah, while he's traveling with Brom. But he's not, it's not been a year. There's no way it's been a year since then. He's only with Ormus and Glader for maybe a month. What? No. No, he is there for, for like two seasons at least. Um, because the all of the Varden moved to Serta in that time. Like there is a lot of shifting around, and 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 Roran um travels from uh oh, gets the that's villagers true. out, and yeah, there's at yeah. least a month that they spend in the spine, and then all the sailing that they do. They're in the spine for a month. Yeah, just getting to Narda, oh, the very first. Oh, okay, place. okay. Yeah. So so he so it might be close to his seventeenth birthday then. It might be close. Yeah, but yeah. he's still a child. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because his birthday is after Brom dies. So they're like running no, to the... Yeah, it is. It's mm, just him and Murtag on the road. Oh, yeah. No, you're right. You're right. But is it... Oh, wait, is it he before doesn't mention they it. get... It's before they get to Gilead, though. Yeah, I believe so. But it's only eight days between Gilead and that. And then it's... I think it's only like... He's only in Trondheim for a few days before the attack. Uh, I think it's like maybe a week and a half. Yeah. Because he, like, no, recovers for months. a few days. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Interesting, yeah. So he, he might be, like, clo- he's 16. There's yeah. still time for you. Um, he is a child. I do love how, I don't know that any but other show gives a shit about this, but you and I do the math on how much time has passed in series more than anybody I know. It's because you ask. Otherwise, I'm I wouldn't, the, I wouldn't. I am the out. only person that cares about this. I think so. I think you are, yeah. Why? Why do I care so much? Why does my brain work the, the way that it does? It's the <laughs> It's okay. It's not I need a bad to. Thing. I need a calendar, and I need the date upon which every event occurs, or else I will be unhappy. <laughs> um, <laughs> I need to know. So they, yeah. So Aragon uh, grabs Sloan. They jump down the mountain with magic. It's like that weird, like you know, like the Cordy game. Where you have to like jump on each the stone. The QWERTY game? Cubert. Uh, that's what it's called. Sorry. Cubert. I was like the no. keyboard. No, no, you're right. You're right. It's like, yeah, it's like this like video game where you have to like, it's like a diamond I know and what you Q-Bert jump on a. Is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyways, um, they play Cubert. <laughs> um, but like the spicy version where you die uh, if you run out of energy. And uh, Aragon does nearly die. He lands at the bottom of Hellgrind and is like, I think. I think I'm dying. I love, I love that this reminded you of Cubert. I, I, am I wrong? Yes. What do you mean? You gotta jump on all the stone <laughs> like platforms. Yeah, yeah. 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 You yeah. jump. Yeah. In that you sometimes jump down in that game. Yes. It is like this. It is like Cubert. In Cubert, you also jump up. <laughs> Well, he might have had to jump to a higher ledge to get to a lower ledge down there. You don't know. We don't have the exact path mapped out, okay? <laughs> I just can't believe you referenced Cuber. Why? I loved that game. Oh, my God. That's so funny. He made um, funny noises. <laughs> what? He did. He sounded very strange. Oh, my God. Anyways. With um, this fucking, like, the, what? fleshlight face. Hubert has yeah, like a yeah the nose yeah it's unfortunate. Anyways, he's got a schnoz made for a dick. Uh, sure does. And that is why this video will have limited monetization. Yep, yep, I guarantee it. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, Aragon nearly dies, and yeah. then sees a bumblebee, and he's like, "Wow, that's pretty incredible." <laughs> and then he steals the life from all the plants around him, so that he can survive and uh, carry on. My wayward son. Yeah, exactly. There'll um, be peace when you are done. Yeah. Literally. That's, be, that's kind of, that kind song of, is kind of about Aragon. Kind of, yeah. Do you think that they were just big Inheritance Cycle fans when they wrote that two decades before the <laughs> Inheritance yes. Cycle came out? Yes, They had the the gift of foresight. Um, so Aragon is like, okay, what the fuck do I do about Sloan? Um, and he talks to Sloan, wakes him up. Uh, Sloan doesn't realize who he is at first. Um, yeah, because Sloan... Doesn't have eyeballs doesn't because have eyes. the Razak ate them. Out. them. Mm-hmm. This book is a horror book. Yeah. Off to go vote, Sylvia. Go vote. We love to see that. I'll have to catch the rest of this in the VOD. We'll catch you later. See have then. fun. We won't see you because we'll be it will be later, but you will you'll see, see us. us. <laughs> 
We love video content. I might be live later today. Oh. With a game. So I you might literally see me back live on this channel later tonight. Oh, fair enough. We, okay. What? You seem so sound, sound surprised. Thought you were gonna stream it on the weekend. No, we talked yesterday about me doing it tonight. Well, have fun with that. No. <laughs> um yeah, so Sloane realizes who Aragon is and it's like, fuck you, I hate you. And Aragon is like, okay, I have I have the power. Sloane is like, no, you don't. I've got the power. And Aragon is like, okay, watch me. Um, and he's like, so you clearly don't regret what you did, but I understand the reasoning for it was Katrina, even though it was incredibly misguided. And so you're and punished. murderous. Yes, you murdered somebody. And so your punishment is that you will never get to see Katrina again. You can never touch her. You can never hear her. You can never be near her. Um, and so it's like, you can't enforce that. And, uh, Aragon's like, watch me. And he, uh, sits there for a while and he determines Sloane's true name. What do you think it is? Bird killer? I don't know. <laughs> no, I think it's, I think it's like. he's a butcher as well. So he's like. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> um, I'm kidding. That was a joke. But. What about like the carver from Carva Hall? The carver from Carva. No, we know, we know from. Uh, f spoilers. Never mind. Um, it's we know from spoilers. It's definitely longer. We are than never that. doing book club on books we've read before. Yeah, we're really again. bad at this. I'm so sorry. Well, and I don't. In uh, we talked about this after last week's episode. Yeah. I love this series. Yes. I love the series. I I really do. And honestly, rereading it, I remember, especially this book. This book is reminds me of why I love this series so much. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't love doing book club without being able to speculate. And yeah. I think that, like, taking the speculation and the, like, ooh, what's going to happen next out of this show has made it less fun to do. Yeah. And so I'm just sitting here trying to make jokes because I want like, this to be having, entertaining. Yeah, we're having a good time, but it definitely, like, it, it is definitely different than with Wheel of Time, obviously. But, like, I can't predict anything because I know what happens. We know what happens. Like, I know who Torsk is, and he's not in this yet. You right, know what I mean? Right, right, Like, I, I know what happens to Goblet Torsk. And so in, in, ter in terms of, like, book club moving forward... This was a very fun exercise to get us to reread books that we already love. Yeah. Um, but uh, I and to get us to Murtag, <clears throat> which we haven't read. Yeah. Right. That that's that's what this whole lead up is for. Um, but so I don't exciting. think we will ever. Um, I don't think we'll ever do this again. Yeah, unless it's like a book that we like. We want to talk to other people about like what it means and the themes and like there's like uh, it's a very I just like, wouldn't do like a book. Um, six weeks of, or four, a month of it. Yeah, 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 exactly. And it's a lot of reading, but <clears throat> yeah. it's it's a lot of fun. It's just very different. Uh, Joe Berlin asked, "Will you do the new book in several episodes or just one episode or the whole book?" This is going to be two episodes because of our flight to LA. So in order to get this in before we leave for Los Angeles for uh, work, uh, we're gonna finish this in two episodes. Um, but you have until. We're, we, we're, that's in like two weeks. We start this. Yeah, Inheritance so, is next week. time to read it. And then part one of Murtag is the following week. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and then part, that is going to be, um, part one is going to cover until. Oh, are you just like picking the a The section called Nal Gorgoth. Great. Good, good. Because that's like the middle of the book. That, yeah, that makes sense. And it sense. is a section break between two sections. I forgot that we're not like, se oops, so we we have to. Mm -hmm. Read up until Nar Nal Gorgoth. Sure. Sure. It's probably a Nurgle name, right? Maybe. I mean, it sounds very like Nargarshvog. So. Nargarshvog. I love Nargarshvog. He's great. He's the best. Great character. I want to wrestle with him. Just Do get you? that bear grease on. Not, not like to the death, but just like a playful For wrestle. For fun. Yeah. You know? Uh -huh, uh -huh. You know, like frat boy, have a couple of beers and get in the mud pit and pretend we're not gay. Ah, cute. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> uh, Joe Berlin asks, and will you two also only read the first half until you have recorded that? No, no. Uh, but we can't talk about why. That but was... you'll know come Saturday. Yeah, that was a plan for for reasons. Uh, we we can't do that unfortunately. That was originally but, um, our plan. The plan has changed. But it's for good reason, we promise. You yeah. will find out later this week. Yeah. Come back to the channel on Saturday. Yeah. Or Friday. Or Friday. We haven't decided we, yet. It depends on things. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You know what? Don't worry about it. Anyways, I know. I know. I know, Joe Berlin. I'm so sorry. It's, it is it. It is how the cookie crumbles. Um, Sometimes life yeah. finds a way. Sure does. And then you have dinosaurs in San Diego. Well. Yeah. Jurassic Park 3. Oh, it's like, I, okay. Uh, the end of Jurassic Park 3 is in... 
Couldn't tell you. San Diego, right? Could not tell I you. Can't remember. Um, so where uh, were we? Uh, so uh, Aragorn determines Lund's true name. Yes. And he sets him on a quest. <clears throat> he says, "You will be compelled to go to Duelden Once you're there, you can never leave. But the elves will take care of you." And you will have a place to live out the rest of your life in comfort. Well, you know, comfort. Like, like. Yeah, no, it's comfort. They, they give him things to do. Like, it's, um. There's, like, bards trying to sing to him. Yeah, yeah. In terms of, like, a life lived, it is relatively comfortable, especially for, you know, uh, like a working class person of this time. Um, and so, oh. what? Apparently, the end of Jurassic Park 3 is in San Francisco. I don't know. Which means that they took that T-Rex all the way up the coast. Never seen it, so <clears throat> couldn't tell you. You've never seen Jurassic Park 3? No, I... Oh, wait, we watched Jurassic Park 1 together. I was like, I've never seen a Jurassic Park movie, and you made me watch the first one, and it was a good time. It's a great movie. We should have reacted to that, but that was before we were doing reaction we content. Reactions. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, Sloane is compelled to uh, go to Duelden Varden, and mm -hmm. what Aragon doesn't tell him is that if he learns from his mistakes... And Alan! He is remorseful of uh, the things that he's done, the elves will restore his eyesight. Yeah. But he doesn't want Sloane to know that so that he can, like, so that he has motivation to yeah. change as a person. Um, and also, if his if his true name changes, Aragon's hold over him will be released. And so a Aragon is like, I have to believe that people can choose to be good. And so I leave this door open, even though it's Sloane doesn't know that it's open, it has to be like a true change that comes from him. I, I agree with that. I also think that there is an element of Aragon understands in this situation that there is very little more harm that Sloane can do. Yeah. And I, I, I think he that can't there's. See. Well, but that's, that is not what I mean. Oh. I, I, blind people are not like. I just mean not he's not going to go murder someone to go see Katrina, is what I mean. I don't know about that. Maybe. I, yeah. I think I think that the only I think that Aragon can reasonably believe that Sloane's goal in protecting Katrina mm -hmm. cannot harm anybody on the path he has sent him on. Oh, and I don't okay. think I think that Aragon can reasonably like because I I think that this is a debatable choice. I think that everyone else being like you should have killed him. Except Until for, Aragon gives his reasons. Except for Nazwada. No, even she says that she, he should have killed him at first. No. Nope. Doesn't she? No, no. He gets back and they're like, "Why the fuck did you stay?" And, and then he tells them the story, and um, Nazwada and Orin are like, "That you know what? That's probably for the best because if you decided that you wanted to wield the law and be the and be king, then uh, you know, yeah, but why that's are we after, here?" That is after Aragon's. After they hear what Aragon has to say. I guess there's no, like, pause in between for them to sure. be like, why the fuck but did you do that? Most people immediately upon hearing that Sloane was alive are just like, well, you should have killed him. He's a murderer. Mm -hmm. And I think that if Aragon ha was under the impression that Sloane was going to hurt someone on his way, yeah. that he wouldn't have let Sloane go. But Sloane is very broken. And, like, yeah. you know, he he's very... Um, he's unarmed. He, he doesn't have a weapon or a way to hurt anybody. Other except Aragon gives him Roran staff. staff. No, but it's Roran staff. True. Which is very funny when Roran yeah. gets back and he's like, you Roran's fucking like, gave... Where's what? my stick? I crossed half of the world on that, with that thing. Um, you, you, you have, like... I think that if there was risk for people, Aragorn wouldn't have done this. Mm -hmm. But but there really isn't. Like, the, the only harm that comes from his actions would be Sloane being harmed by him. Yeah. And I think that... I get frustrated a lot when we watch stuff that have protagonists who don't kill people... And it leads to other people dying. Mm -hmm. And I just, I find it very eye rolly. I think that reasonable people understand self-defense is a, and, and the, the, there is a, there is a line, right? Like I am one of those people who I have, I, I like Man of Steel quite a bit. Um, the, the complaint about Man of Steel that I've never agreed with is why did Superman kill Zod? Don't care. He was totally justified. Zod was about to laser beam a child in half. He yeah. should have killed Zod earlier in that fight so fewer people would have died. Yeah. And uh, we just had this in Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood where I was like, yeah, Ed, you get to not kill people because you have magic powers, but the people that you're letting live are killing a lot of people right now. Yeah. 
I find that argument morally very suspect. And I think that if you leave people alive to go murder people, you're not the you're not in the right. 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 But the reason Sloan is different is because Sloan only hurt people out of a desire to like protect Katrina. And once you remove that piece of the puzzle, Sloan's not gonna go murder people like and i think the maturity with which aragon is able to articulate that when he gets to the varden because he runs back to the varden there there's there's not a lot that really happens he just runs a lot he does talk with his lanzati which i guess he talks with the lanzati he meets tinga the sorcerer who's crazy Tinga, but tinga's he, great he kills some people on the road and when he gets to the Varden, they're like, yeah, but you killed those people. Why didn't you kill Sloane? Yeah. And he's like, well, they were going to hurt me. And Sloane was a blind man on his knees in the woods. Yeah. And Aragon, I think that him being able to have that mature look at the difference in the morality between those two situations and be able to, as a character, articulate why he was behaving differently in those two situations yeah. makes him a very interesting protagonist rather than being like steadfast, I don't kill because killing is bad, yeah. which I think just isn't... It's so much more complicated. It, it's not real. And this real. book treats it that way. I, I think that characters who never kill aren't real because sometimes in the situations that these characters end up in, there, there isn't another option. Yeah. Right? And I really appreciate characters who can make the moral distinction and articulate it. Yeah. And that it, it it speaks to the maturity with which Aragon has grown into himself in this book. This character who has gone from being fucking useless in the first book to being a leader of, like, worth... And the arc of that, I think, is the best part of Eldis. And who doesn't seek, who has no desire to be the one to wield judgment over people. Yeah. Right? Like, the, I think that that is a huge part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why Nazwada and Orin, like, are, are on board with his choice. Um, because that is a slippery slope. If you believe that you know what's best... And can pass judgment on anyone that you that you want like that like you can very easily <laughs> make mistakes. Uh, Pink Armando's right. It's uh, the conversation with Arya after they kill the soldiers, not with the Varden. Thank you. Um, yeah, but that that's the conversation I'm talking about, Pinky. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because Nazwada and Oren are like on Aragon's side, but uh, yeah, Arya is like, what the fuck? Yeah, because they don't want him to be. A They're trying to unseat a tyrant. They don't want to replace him with a tyrant. Exactly, exactly. And, just, and it gives Arya a moment of pause because she is present for it. And she's like, she, she's like, she's thinking about it. Well, and I, I think that Arya's worldview is so dark, right? And so... Yes. In, in, she's been fighting for a hundred years. Yeah, and, and fighting a losing battle for a hundred years. And I think that one of the ways in which Aragon influences her in these books is I do think that he brings some lightness back to her yeah. that is missing from her as a character. Yeah. Um, because her lover died. Yeah. Um, we find out that she, yeah. he meets up with Arya because she she runs to him. She runs. And, yeah, she runs and Aragon runs. And Aragon's like, I'm, I, I'm not that fast, but I can run for a long time. So <laughs> do you want like, me no. to go? And they're like... No, don't. Just Ar let Arya do her thing. Yeah, They're the protagonists. Let yeah. them do what they want. But yeah, they, they meet up and um, uh, uh, Aragon explains to her what happened and um, they mm -hmm. have to run back to the Varden. Um, and e they do have this really interesting difference of opinion and uh, there's a really beautiful scene where they're sitting at the campfire and uh, Arya kind of opens up to Aragon about uh, Falain. Fa mm -hmm. Falain? Fuck. It's too close to Wheel of Time. Yeah. Falain. Fallon, 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 fuck, fuck, fucking fuck face. Uh, yes, who was murdered by Durza in uh the prologue of book one? Um, yeah. that uh, they were partners, they were lovers, um, companions for twenty years. Um, and twenty years I have waited <laughs> for a gift like yours to appear. That weird dick I've tried to suppress or hide. I don't know what that um, is. Um, what? What? You don't know what I just saying? No. I was going to go with 20 years I sat and waited. I'm very dedicated, but... For a gift like yours to appear, that weird quirk you've tried to suppress or hide is a talent that could help you meet the wizard. Oh, okay. There it is. Yeah, If yeah. you make good. Yeah, okay. Um, I recognize it now. It's fine. Jesus, I'm so disappointed in you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, so Arya uh, is not interested in Aragon because she's older than him and also because she just got out of a relationship because uh, she's a widow that was longer than his life. Truly. Yeah, longer than Aragon has been alive. And what is Aragon's response to that? 
Yeah, but like, when can I smash though? It's the one, it is the one scene in this book. He's that 16. Isn't my favorite. I know. And he puts it aside. He's like, uh, I, I, I feel this way and like, I can't help she it. She doesn't say it out loud. He doesn't say it out loud. Yeah. But like, there Thankfully. isn't, it, his response is just a little bit weird to me. Just a little bit. Well, it's one of those things where, uh, you know, sometimes our first impulses aren't the greatest. And yeah, that's true. And it's and it's the fact that he doesn't say anything that merits his character, not what his first impulse was. Mm-hmm. Um, and and uh, Joe Berlin also brings up a really good point that like Arya has a moment where she was like to think that I would be lectured in m- morality by someone who is the lit- literal child to me, you know, uh, like she is given a moment of pause yeah. because of Aragon's worldview. Because, like you said, she's been fighting a war for a hundred years and losing. Yeah. <laughs> and that's hard. And like, her lover is dead. Yeah, like, I don't yeah. blame Arya for her worldview. It is It is an interesting element to put into the book, given that Angela's prophecy says that they're going to have an epic romance. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it just doesn't... I... <sighs> it is tough because we don't get a lot of Arya POV. We don't get any. Isn't there some in inheritance? Oh. It's just that, like, in order for them to have a I don't romance, think so. Arya needs to have room to grieve Fallon, in my opinion. Yeah. That she doesn't get because of the because nature she's... of their fight. Well, because Fallon is killed and then she's immediately taken prisoner by Durza for months. Well, and, and once she gets out, it's into the fight. Like, it's, yeah. it's not like there's time. And so... I just, I, I don't know that there's, because I, I, I don't really remember, because I remember the very end, right? But there's a lot of the next book I don't remember. Mm-hmm. And there isn't any romance in this book between the two of them. But the prophecy says epic romance. And I, I just don't know that there's room for it. And I, I can't remember Maybe how it it's handled. but yet. Oh, like it happens in... Murtag. Uh, maybe. On maybe. shelves. Maybe. They're going to Go live for it. like 10,000 years. Well, exactly. So right? like, There is plenty of time. Right? Because here's the thing. If you're like, look, this person is 100 years old and this person is 16, that age gap kind of sus. But if the one yeah. person is 1,000 years old and the other person is 916, you're like, eh, that's not really much of a difference anymore. You know what I mean? This this might be controversial, uh-huh. but I would argue... Hi, Fabu. That after this war is done, mm-hmm. after Galbatorx is lay slain, the age gap doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. Um, I think that I, I and I understand that like that might I understand why, how that might sound because he I, he's like seventeen, but there there's an element of we fought a war together. I am a mortal. There's no one of my species because I don't, I'm neither human nor elf. Where you just kind of have to be like, for this very special boy, the rules of like that don't apply in the same way. Well, later on, because he in can't this, like date. Later on in this book, him and Roran have the same conversation. Or no, no, no. Sorry, that is actually before this when they're waiting to go to Hellgrind. When they're yeah, waiting yeah, the yeah, yeah. We they have a really that. interesting conversation where Roran's like, "So Arya, huh?" And Aragorn's like, "I don't want to fucking talk about it." And Roran's like, "There's a bunch of hot ladies who would love to marry you." And Aragorn's like, "Yeah, okay, what?" And I'm gonna live forever, yeah. and they're all gonna die. And Roran's like, "Wait, you're gonna live forever?" And he's like, "Yeah, bitch." And so it's how do like, I how do I date? Yeah, how, like you know, how so do I take a girl to the spring social? Yeah, so it's safer. How do I take a girl to the Agati Bladrin? Um, like it, it's it's one and of those. He was like he spent like the last few months with the orgy elves who just have like sex parties in the forest. I mean, pretty much the fertility rights, whatever it is. Um, but, but yeah, he says to, like, Roran is like, so it's safer just to love and pine after Arya mm-hmm. instead of letting your heart free to, you know, love someone who's going to die and be alive for, like, 1% of your life, you know? Uh, Caleb Tatro, yeah. thank, thank you for that super chat. That's super chat. My understanding, the Razak were perfect hunters of humans. Yes. And came from across the street like humans. Correct. Are you sure CP said they're dragon hunters? I don't think they are dragon hunters, but I think they hunted dra- uh, dragon riders for Galbatorix after the fall. Yes, yeah, so Galbatorix recruits the two leather blocka that are left. Um, and offers yeah. them, like, uh, their favorite food, which is human, obviously. Yeah. I feel like Galbatorix kind of, know. like... I think they like dwarf. It's just harder to get dwarf to Drosliana. Sure, that's fair. That's you know, fair. it's a tougher meat. Sure. And more hair, probably. 
Uh, those beards and... It's, it's a lot, you know. Hrothgar's yeah. beard, it's, it's pretty crazy. But yeah, uh, it's they're, they're dragon hunters because uh, Galbatorx enlists them to be the people um, under his service who keep an eye on that kind of thing. Make but sure I, do, I understand what you're and, saying, though, about... Um, they, they 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 wouldn't have evolved to hunt human or to hunt dragons because there were no dragons where they come from. Yeah, I mean, so that's I, actually an interesting point, Caleb. Well, the, the, they just ended up being really good at that. But but also, like, I think that while the ancient language didn't exist where the humans came from, so they didn't have magic in that way. I do believe that like magic from shades and the ability to connect with someone's mind spirits, would have. You mean? Sorry, sorry, to become a shade. So I do think there would have been... I wouldn't be surprised if what they fled from was a shade, right? It was um, Some kind of When humanity like fled across the ocean and the Razak fled following them, I wouldn't be surprised if it was a shade that they were fleeing from, right? Some uh, a, a calamity of someone invoking spirits too strong to withhold and that that, that is what is controlling that land. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, because the spirits are a really fascinating part of the series that are never really explained in any manner. I do um, like though that they are not dead people. I like that the spirit. Yeah. I like that spirits are a separate entity. Yeah, they are a, like a race of of things that have consciousnesses that like function so differently to to ours that we can't really understand them. Asher Amy says, "How many female POVs do we get?" I think um, Joe Berlin is right. Yeah, just Safira and Naswada. Then I thought we yeah. got an Aryan POV in the I next book. I don't think so. I know I could be wrong. Could be wrong, but I do not. Yeah. Believe. Um. So, uh, we we need to get moving here because there's a lot. Uh, uh, this is important. Arya makes a boat of grass that will fly forever. Yes, which honestly is rad. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Trial of the Long Knives. Nasuada gets challenged by um Fadawar. Yeah. He's and... like the head of one of the like wandering tribes from in around the Beaver Mountains. Yeah, um, and it is uh, a a trial. Where uh, leader gets to lead the Varden and the wandering tribes. Basically, leader gets both, and yeah. the winner gets both. And so they have to cut themselves with a knife, um, and the one who can cut themselves the most wins. So pretty you much, know, <clears throat> there's a lot of emo kids in the early 2000s who are crushed. <laughs> oh my god, yeah, it's one of those very like. Uh... <laughs> there, there, there was a time in my life where a lot of my friends did this. And so, uh, I listened to Green Day. I know I don't look like it now, but I was a, <laughs> I was an alt kid. He's a little emo boy. <clears throat> I was a little, a little emo boy. Kid. Um, I never really fit in with them, but they were nice to me, and everyone else bullied me. So I was like, I'll hang out with these kids. Fair. And we did drugs together. It was fun. The, but the <laughs> reading this, I was like, yeah, yeah. I know people who did this. Well, she's it's quit, so dark. Like, it's so sad, but you know, it's the reality of the world. Yeah, yeah, it's it's like the the idea of the trial is like how much pain are you willing to like withstand <clears throat> yeah. f- to be the leader. Which is fine to me. What makes the trial of the long knives fucking cool as shit mm-hmm. is that A, Nasawada goes like so many cuts. She almost gets to the point where she can't put another cut on her other arm. So I think they would go to legs. Um, well, so you can have you can't have any more than six cuts in one arm, and she does six, and she does three. Right. So I think that if she got to six, they would have to start doing thigh or something. Pro- probably. Although I think you would pass <clears> out <throat> from blood loss before you could get to that point. Mm, I don't know. It depends. Yeah, maybe. Um, it depends on how big you are. Like Fadawar has a huge advantage in this, being so much taller than her. Um, <clears throat> does that matter? Yeah. I mean, the amount of blood in your body would make a significant difference. But do, you're taller than me. Don't you just have more blood in your body? Yeah, and so if we're losing so the same faster. amount of no, no. But if we're moving, if we're losing the same amount of blood uh-huh. from the same size cuts, yeah, I am going to last longer. But it's not like once you reach like one liter of blood, it that number would be dependent on the size of you as well, because it's yeah. about the blood pressure in your veins. So like, if you lost like a liter and a half, and I lost a liter, but be, the I mean, this is just rough math, but like that would equal out because of our size difference. But if you are cutting veins and you're not hitting an artery and we're losing blood at the same rate then you're going to pass out first why my threshold might be lower than yours is what do you because mean? i'm smaller yeah but you'll have lost more blood percentage wise to your body uh-huh no i won't have lost more blood in percentage wise my body yes you will if you lose a liter and i lose a liter 
you've lost more blood than I have, even though we've lost the same amount of blood. So unless Fadawar's wounds are bleeding more... No, I'm saying that because she's smaller, that the threshold for when you would pass out might be lower for me because it's about the pressure, like... I, I don't think it's about pressure, though. I, I don't know why you pass out because of blood loss, so I'm yeah. not a doctor. <laughs> Hashtag not a doctor. I, I, I don't know. I don't We're know. Maybe, both probably wrong. But maybe he does have an advantage. I don't know enough about... He doesn't because he fucking loses. Fuck you, Fatalar. Well, yeah, yeah. I don't know enough about the human dumbass. body to, to, to know why that would be... Yeah. What makes this scene really work for me is Nasuwada's commitment to not getting him healed afterwards. Oh, right? yeah. Like, it, and Elvis' prediction. If it prediction. was just this quick... And we'll get to that. Uh, if it was just a quick, we you did it, it, and then we're healed, and then, and then it's over, and I have more power over the Varden now because I did the thing, I'd be like, oh, okay, she's got force of will. That's awesome. It is the it is the fact that she lives with the consequences for so long into the book. For the rest of her life. And Because she never heals the scars, right? Well, yeah, but scars, scars, are, scars are cool. Everybody knows sure. scars are cool. Yeah. Um, there's nothing wrong with having scars. Right. No, no, nothing wrong. The, it's just, it's more how society views them. Nah, scars are cool. People dig scars. Um, I don't have any cool scars, except this one. But it's not even that cool. I just took a puck to the head like an idiot. Uh, God, I'm so Canadian. The The commitment to not healing them, despite the situation that they're in, shows a greater force of will, in my opinion, than dealing with the pain of the fight, of the of the trial. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And we do find out afterwards, Elva is like, yeah, I saw you lose. So I told you that you won so that you would win. Well, and we know that going into the trial, she's going, oh, I'm not going to lose because Elva says that I win. Yeah. <clears throat> Very fun. And I love, I love that Elva's prophecies aren't true. Yeah, that what she says and that she can actually um, affect the outcome based on her own actions. Mm -hmm. She can, she can actually change how things happen. Um... Uh, so they get, uh, Aragorn and Sphere come back, <clears throat> they run into everybody and they're like, okay, this is what happened to us, and Rowan's like, this is what happened to me. Yeah. Uh, and then, oh wait, does Roran, is Roran already out fighting at this point? No. Is that after the wedding? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so they get back, and Roran is being sent out on a mission, uh, just before they're getting back, and Roran's like, can't wait until Aragorn's back, and Naswad is like, why? And he's like, I gotta marry Katrina, and she's like, you want me to not send you on a mission so that you can get married? And he's like, yeah, I it's impregnated really, her. It's really, important. I put a bun in the oven. Yeah. And, uh, it's if we don't get married real fast, her family, the, the, whatever, like, familial connection she has left from Carvajal will all disown us. So please allow us to not lose everything. Yeah. And that's why I was like... It's like, okay, fine. Fucking... Fucking babies. <laughs> Gross. I mean, I get it. You know, she... <clears> like, <throat> the, the... Like, she she has Rowan's allegiance, but, like, showing a level of understanding is important. Cyber Moose is trying to derail this stream. Uh, Dwayne Swab says, The trial of the Long Knives was definitely a male ritual. So says Angela. Yeah, I mean, I, Angela is always right, so... I don't know that I agree with that. <clears throat> hmm. I, 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 I could very much see a woman who has gone through the pain of childbirth being like, hey, I've got an idea for how we can choose who's in charge. I'm going to shove this up your asshole. <laughs> we can see... No, we can see who can deal with pain the best. I don't think dealing with pain is a uniquely male trait. And I could see this being... This is almost... <clears throat> but like, here's the thing. I trial think... by combat is something that I think gives so much of an advantage to men. But I think the trial of the long knives, there is more fairness to it than most other ways we choose leaders or have in the past. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I I'll, I'll agree with you there. But I think that it is a very mm. masculine idea that because you can withstand more pain that makes you a good leader, when in reality, the... the, the, the... <laughs> The skills required to be a good leader don't really have to do with pain endurance. Um, it, it depends on, yeah, I, I, I somewhat agree with you. I think that there are times and places where leadership is less about being smart 
and more about just bringing people together. Because I, I, I don't think the trial has anything to do with pain endurance, actually. It is about proving to the people around you that you would give all of yourself for them, right? Sure, and that is definitely how people view it, yeah. And I think that that... Well, I, I I understand that the like machismo of winning feels very traditionally masculine. Mm-hmm. I think the idea of giving all of oneself to their community isn't. Mm. And so that's where I don't nest. I think that Nas- I think that Angela saying this about the trial of the long knives is her putting a perspective on it that I don't think she's fully looking at why this is the way that it is and what it means to this community. Mm-hmm. I obviously don't agree with it, right? I don't think it's a good idea. Um, I think that if both of your good leaders die because they're trying to cut themselves to prove that they would cut themselves for you is very strange. Yeah. But I, I do I do think that the idea of being of service, it goes back to the Aes Sedai and Wheel of Time again, right? Like the, the, the Aes Sedai means servants of all. Yeah. And that's really what this trial is about becoming, is about becoming the, the a, a giver. Uh, and that is a, a traditionally um, feminine role in most communities, right? The, 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 the caretaker and the person who would, you know, take that pain upon themselves for their community. Mm. Um, and so I, I, I don't know. I think that while there is a masculine element to it, I think there's also a very fe- feminine element to it. And I think that that is why this is a great trial for a man and a woman to compete against one another in. Yeah. That I don't know that there's a significant advantage either way, right? Yeah. Um, I, I, I've seen, I, I, I've never seen, hmm, I don't know how to phrase this. I don't believe that there is an amount of pain that a man could feel that a woman couldn't. Yeah. And if giving birth is anything to go by, I'm right. <laughs> yeah. Have you seen those videos of men dealing with, um, the cramping cramps. pains? Oh my God. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I think, um. Joe Berlin says, I think it is a good trial if dedication is the quality you look for in a leader. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah, it's like, it is one of those things that feels very, like, archaic in a sense. But it is more interesting than just, like, a fucking arm wrestle. You know what I mean? Like, it is infinitely yeah. more interesting because we can have these conversations about what that actually means for someone to compete in and to, to do to themselves. Yeah. Um, Blige Monkey says gingers have a higher pain tolerance, I do believe. This brings up a funny story. I'm going to bring up. (laughs) So we were at a doctor's office last week to talk about a consultation for Chlorus. And the doctor was asking these probing questions because there was maybe a surgery involved. It's not a big deal. It's not happening. Don't worry, chat. There's literally nothing. But, um, we're sitting there and he's asking these questions and I was like, about um, whether you've been under general anesthesia or anyone in your, oh. has anyone in your family ever been under genes, general anesthesia? And I it, like a light bulb went off in my head and I was like, oh, she's not a real ginger. And he was like, good to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was trying to figure out if you were a ginger or not. And I thought it was so funny. <laughs> I did not realize that that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. um, gingers are, it's like, they're, they're more likely to have the anesthesia not work properly. No, that it's that. It? Um, no, it's that they're uh, they process it faster. Oh, fat. That's what it and is. And so they are more likely to wake up earlier than you expect. Right. By like fifteen percent. It's like that's a significant crazy. margin. And so he, I could just. I was wondering what his questions were getting at. Yeah. And then as soon as I looked at your hair and I was like, oh wait, he's trying to figure out if. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, I don't get no, no. I it was very funny. Know. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, let's keep going. Um. Roran wants to get mariaged. Yes, yes. And then the elves arrive. Uh, yeah. From his Lanzaris. We got Bloodgarm and his, like, uh, contingency of elves. How do you feel about the Bloodgarm thing? What do you mean? Aragon and Roran both have a moment of being like, oh, women are after him because he puts off pheromones magically that attract women. But we never see him act upon it in any weird way no he never does and i don't know i wonder if it is intentional or if it's just like a byproduct yeah yeah. a side effect like i I wonder if like if he even really notices and i don't remember yeah because i don't know if it comes up you know, I don't think it ever, I don't think it comes up in inheritance it doesn't come up again in this book other than aragon being like well that's not fair to women and I was like, yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, yeah. It's like Sex Panther. It works 90% of the time. 
all the time. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it is one of those, like, strange things where, I'm, like, it very well could be unintentional, I think, just based off of, like, the animalistic quality to the shape that he has chosen. But I yeah. don't know. I, I don't, I'm I, honestly not sure. I do like the idea that the elves are physically changing their bodies, but there there are like deeper. It's it's not just skin deep. Yeah. Like because they they even talk the way they talk about the way that Bloodgar moves. It's not just that he wants to look a certain way, but he has influenced him his like whole being. Yes. And I I would I would wager a guess that his true name changed when he did that. It's it's mm. such a deep or, or or his body now matches what his true name was. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right, right, right. And That's if he fair. does decide to become a mer person, uh, a fish. then his true name would change it before he makes that physical change, right? Yeah, yeah. I interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Aragon and Arya get back, uh, and it's time to get married. And uh, just in time for marriage. <laughs> What? Murtag and Thorn attack. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. It's the day of the wedding. Yeah. Which is, like, rude. You know what I mean? Like. Eh, kind of. But, like, it's also Murtag's job. I guess, yeah. Um, they attack, and uh, obviously Murtag is not anticipating Aragon having help from the elves mm -hmm. as spellcasters. Um... He's got, you know, like, these, like, items. Uh, 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 Murtag has, like, an item imbued with, like, a healing spell or whatever. And then the elves are like, okay, but Which well, let really, us... I didn't think about it. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the, the, the orbs I created for Roleplay Relay? Yeah. That were a spell that was already cast? It's in fucking Aragon. I did not steal that from Aragon. But it's so interesting that he can't be counterspelled because it, it's already cast. Yeah. It's yeah, a it cool funny. idea that I came up with. Yeah, I also had that idea. I love that art you know, uh, can't really come up with anything original. I anymore. know, and I was like, I thought that the the the, the orbs that I could, the, that you can't counterspell because the the spells already been cast, but you could dispel the magic of them. I thought I was so fucking smart, and then I was reading this fucking book, and I was like, wait, Christopher Paolini and I had the same fucking idea, but I I know I read this book fifteen years ago, mm -hmm. so there is a chance that it was just in the back there, and so you know what, Christopher Paolini, we're gonna take joint custody. And uh, I don't want to hear from your lawyer, okay? <laughs> if you want, if you have a problem, we can talk directly. Just call me. Yeah. You have my phone number. Um, you don't. You don't you have do, my phone number. Yet. I'll give it to you on Thursday. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. I mean. Maybe, okay. Generous read. Generous read. Mm -hmm. Maybe Murtag wasn't attacking the wedding. Maybe Murtag was trying to come to his cousin's wedding. And... They just... They it, misinterpreted him he, being there? He didn't technically get an invitee. He kind of invited himself. But maybe he and was just insulted, coming to the wedding. Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's definitely it. He's well, like, I really know, want to be at the wedding. He's never been to a wedding before, except mm -hmm. the weddings of his enemies. And he's he was just... he. I think that he was sad to be left out. Yeah, yeah. He just, he just really wanted an invitation. He polished the shit it. out of Thorn that day. Like, Thorn was gleaming. Gleaming! He was a gleaming. He, yeah. He sang about the heroes of the horn. Mm -hmm. All 13 of them. Yeah. Uh, uh, they, they have a good fight. They have a good fight. Uh, they, they There's not really, like, one person is, like, f superior than the other. They, they both do some damage to one another, and then uh, they fuck off. I, I, not really, though. The, the, what's interesting about this fight uh -huh. is this is the first time they're evenly matched. Yeah. There's no... This, this fight is the reason why I think that... Uh, Murtag would have won. Oh, at, on the burning planes. On the burning planes. Yeah. Um, if which e even if even if Aragon was at full strength, because Aragon needs the thirteen elves to balance the Eldunari here. Yeah. But it's it's not the fight that's interesting. It's the moments before where Aragon goes, but whoa, 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 hey, can we talk? And Murtag's like, What do you want? All right. <laughs> okay. And they're just like flying in the air and everyone's looking at them like, what are they yeah. doing? And, Murta and Aragon says like, hey, like if you can change yourself so fundamentally that your true name changes, you will be free of Galbatorix's rule. And I am 100% sure that that will not come back in the next book or be important. Yeah, very not important. Kind of a, you know. That's side. why there's a book called Murtag. What, what do you mean? What do you mean? Um, uh, 
But no, I, I do, I, I really like that, like, despite Hrothgar's death, and despite everything Murtag and Thorn have done, despite, like, the, the, the enmity between them. Yeah. Aragorn is still trying to save his friend. Yeah. Because yeah. he understands, like, you know, like, a part of him hates Murtag for what he's done, but he also doesn't understand that, like, sorry, he does understand that, like, Murtag having a hold over him... Uh, has like forced him into positions, and, and even if Mer- even if Galvatorx didn't know Murtag and Thorn's true names, yeah. like h- holding Thorn uh, like hostage against Murtag, and vice versa, yeah, it'd like, be enough, right? Th- that, even Safira says enough. that if um, Galvatorx had Aragon, she'd probably just turn herself in. Exactly, it's yeah. it's it's a terrifying prospect, but Nicholas Cadillo, um, thank you for that super chat. Welcome on in. Sorry, I'm late. I was reading. Murtag. Murtag. On shelves now, not a sponsor. No. I just like the cover a lot. It's great. Because it looks like Thorn from the um, Eldest cover, but yeah. he's bigger. And, and then this is more just a nice... very direct front profile. Or not profile. Direct, like, front facing shot. That's cool. Um, so then uh, they they do fight. Murtag fucks off because he loses this time. Um, but not before Aragon. There's a bunch of shit that's actually happened. Uh, Aragon... Has Aragon, half cured Elva. Yeah, yeah. He like goes to Elva and he's like, "I'm gonna try and fix this." There's two different ways I can do it. This way, I think it has a better chance of success, but mm-hmm. it's a little more unpredictable. And now, so I ask her to not want to the, and she's like, "No, fuck you. I'm dying. Please save yeah, me from this." I am in so much pain every day. You literally do not understand what you're asking of me. Aragon pulls gold out of the ground to repay well people. sorry first El- elva is healed in a sense that she doesn't have the like crippling compulsion to stop people from getting hurt yeah. but she can still tell what their weaknesses are and if they're going to be hurt she can choose when to help yeah yeah so fascinating definitely not going to be important later um, aragon uh does go around gold. and he he pulls gold out of the ground to repay his debts yeah. Uh, my favorite of which is repaying the uh, ox hide tanner. For the saddle. Uh, and then when the guy's like, my hide's made a saddle for a dragon. Yeah, he gets very excited. Ged- Gedrick is like... <laughs> Best day ever. That is That means more to me than anything. He destroyed all of his stock anyway, so the Empire couldn't use it. Now, the one thing about this Gifts of Gold thing is that Aragon forgot somebody. <laughs> Who did he forget? He forgot to repay a horse for the meat that he bought when uh, Sloan wouldn't trade for Saphira's egg. That wasn't to be repaid. Oh, no. Aragon says he would come and work off that debt, and then he never does. I know that. But I'm just saying. that horse didn't do it for payment. No, I know he didn't. And I think but neither did Gedrick. Arazu, thank you for that super chat. Yeah, I mean, no, he stole from memberships. Gedrick. Thank you for the oh, memberships. Oh, thank you for five gifted membos. Fabu got one. Appreciate that. Uh, Rage Titan got one. Yeah, let's, let's go. Let's go Rage Titan. Um... Yeah, it is different because obviously horse offers and, and it's fine and with Gidrick he stole from. But I'm just saying that like poor horse is like, where's my gold? Uh, that's fair. You know what? That's fair. Uh, although horse is doing fine. He's a blacksmith in a like army. He space. gives uh, Helen, uh, Jode's wife. Her name's Helen, right? Yep. Uh, he gives her gold so that she can start a business and she immediately is like, I'm going to take over the mead market. I'm gonna be the mead lady. She knows exact like she is a fucking entrepreneur. I love it. She's a businesswoman through and through. But uh, Jode gives Aragon a book, and he's like, "Oh my god, I own a book." To me, Aber weirda, yeah. I love. I also love Aragon's like, "This is your most expensive book," and he's like, "Yeah, in the Empire where it's banned." Here, Here it's fucking worthless. It's like a copy of the Fault in Our Stars in Florida. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, yeah, yeah, Aragon owns his first book, which is very fun. And uh, in that, he also goes and gets a uh, sword. It's a falchion. Oh, well, he also says Jode can ride Saphira one day. Which has not happened has yet. Has not happened, yeah. What What is this sword that he gets? A falchion, yeah. Yeah, uh, he gets a falchion. Uh, it immediately breaks, so it doesn't matter. But I yeah. got really excited about the falchion. Cause they took a lot of time role. going... <laughs> yeah, going oh, through... I want a falchion. <laughs> they took a lot of time going through the different weapons. And, like, you know, the fact of, like, Aragon's fighting style really is important when choosing a weapon for him. And <laughs> Frederick is like, have a mace then. And he's like, no, I don't want to fight. I, I, I fight with the sword. Um, but, yeah, he enforces Which, it with magic and it's still not enough. Honestly? hmm Honestly. Aragon should probably use a mace. Eh. You can't stab, like... You don't need to stab when you are so much stronger than a normal person. 
You like because of Ar so Aragon's strength is so high that if he were to use a bludgeoning weapon, he wouldn't need to be good. He would be able to. But he says if he ever faces a shade, he can't stab him through the heart with a mace. Get a mace with a pointy end. Get a get a morning star and stab with the morning star. Oh my god. <clears throat> I'm just saying, Aragon's strength is high enough that he wouldn't have to like dip around shields as much if he was just breaking through them. Maybe. Roran, if Roran can kill 193 men Roran with a fucking hammer. Roran is not fighting shades, who specifically only die if you stab through the heart. Anyways, uh, so yeah, so uh, Aragon and Mertag. But so this is fight. the this is the blade this is the blade the falchion that he's like I'm gonna use a falchion and then he goes and fights Zarok and Mertag and Zarok just breaks his falchion. He's like fuck. No, that doesn't happen yet. Yeah, it breaks in um, Farthendor. Does it? Yeah, it lasts a little bit longer. Oh, it, oh my God! There's so much book left. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um. Oh the, my God! There's so much. We need to start talking. Yeah. So, um, there's also a uh, scary uh, zombie laughing soldiers who cannot feel pain that attack with Murtag and scare the shit out of the Varden. Yeah. Because they're like, oh, I killed that guy, and then he stands back up, and you're like, didn't kill that guy. You can only yeah. chop off their heads. Um, absolutely terrifying. Then they struggle to kill these people a lot, and I'm like, once you know to just go for the head, just go for the head. It's like it's like zombie movies where they know to go for the head, and then in Act Three they're still shooting people in the chest, and I'm like, guys, what are we doing? Yeah. They're like, oh, they're they they're so much harder to kill. I'm like, not really. Yeah. Just go. Just you. You have magic, and you have you you're you're you're, like sometimes in the writing of the book, I'm like, Aragon, you're so fast <laughs> compared to a human. Yeah. That you shouldn't. That this should not be hard. What shouldn't be hard? Anything. Fighting them, them not feeling pain should not be hard for you. Aragon doesn't fight those guys. Not even once, I don't think. Oh, yeah, that's It's fair. just the normal dudes. He does an inheritance, but. Yeah, like it's just one of those things where I think it's just terrifying to the Varden. Like, they're that's like. That's fair. Yeah, it's they're, morale breaking. They're scared out of their wits. Oh, they're, yeah. they're creepy as hell. Again, when this book goes horror. I fucking love it. Well done. They're, and the, the fact that they keep laughing. I don't know why they laugh. Like, I don't... I love the idea that Galbatorix... They're Gal fucking crazy. But I love the idea that Galbatorix, like, puts that in the spell because he like, thinks it's it funny. like, maybe it tickles. I, I just like the idea that Galbatorix is, like, adding in extra things just to be a little goofy. Right. He's just trying to... He's like, oh, what if they chuckled constantly? Horrifying. Um, but they fight them off, and Roran and Katrina get married. It's cute. The, it's the wedding's beautiful. very cute. Uh, Nazwada gives uh, Katrina a dowry, which is, like, fucking rad. Uh, Aragon is like, here, Roran, you take Snowfire, because, like, I'm never going to ride him, and he needs to be taken care of. Um, glad they kind of tied that up. And, um, yeah, they have a cute little party. It's a good time. Yeah, so Aragon, yeah, they, this is where the, everybody kind of splits up again. Aragon goes to help Auric become king, uh, and... Roran becomes, Roran starts being tested for leadership. Yeah, he goes to become like a, a soldier under someone else's command to uh, help, um, uh, what is the city? Fucking, I don't know. He's going to go serve under um, Redbeard. Uh, anyways. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Which is, is, is fun. Um, he befriends Karn. A uh, fun spellcaster who uh, does not make it out of this book alive. Who eats the most disgusting shit. Yeah, that. Wait, it, doesn't make it out of this book alive. Karn? Yeah. Yeah, he does. Does he? Yeah. Did you read too far ahead? Maybe. Yeah, no, Karn's still alive at the end of the book. That's, sorry. <laughs> this live content, my bad. I, I definitely thought that that happened in this book. Nope. Great. Uh, sorry about it. <laughs> this is, this is, we're live. There's nothing I can do. You're welcome. Uh, sorry. I, if I spoiled it for you, I do apologize. That's my bad. You're doing great, babe. Doing I, great. You know what? <laughs> it's not. It's not. It's, yeah. It this is series it is. is too intertwined in your head. I know. That's the thing is, yeah. like, it is... It is it's it is a whole entity that yeah. I I do yeah sometimes find it hard to parse what happens. Yes, I I killed Karn. Uh, um, Roran's first mission goes really well. He kills four soldiers while they're raiding uh, the supply convoy for Galbatorix's army. Mm -hmm. And Martin Redbeard's like, you're good dude. Well done. Uh, ten out of ten. Aragon goes to um, the dwarves. Uh, 
there's a lot that happens, but we don't need to talk about all of it. We can burn through the dwarf stuff pretty fast. We meet there's Hvedra, some cool which is shit. Nice. Yeah. Hvedra's really cool. Yeah. They go to the forests of stone. Yeah, that's sick. Which is so oh, funny because they're like young dwarves have to carve out trees as punishment <laughs> to like make them more patient. We also he, Aragon did run with Nargarshvog there, and they do have like um, some moments of understanding. Aragon, Aragon comes Aragon to the understanding that he can eat meat sometimes. Yes. If necessary. Yes. yes. And when he needs to. Um, Nargarshvog's great. I fucking love him. It's I would a love character. a Nargarshvog book. I would love that right? sequel. Um, we'll ask for it. Um, just like, uh, but but like, it's just like Nargarshvog. It's there's no fighting. It is just him trying to impress women with his horns. Oh my god. Nargarshvog needs a mate. Yeah. That's the that's the title of the book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, so, they, uh, they, we do, we get these really cool, like, the trees, the forest is really cool. Yeah, Oric is like, do I have your support, Aragon? And Aragon's like, well, I have to keep the Varden in mind. And Oric's like, trust me, if it doesn't look like I'm gonna win, yeah. just put your support behind me, because whoever I then support, if I have to, will also have your support, but and he it kind will of, be fine. he's, it's, he's meaner than that. He kind of gives it to Aragon, where he's like... He's like, you don't fucking trust me? Do you, do you think I'm dumb? Yeah, yeah, honestly, though. And do he's you like, think I'm dumb? How, how, hey, Aragon, how about you, uh, how about you do your fucking job as a member of my clan? And I'll do with the politics. And <laughs> I'll do the, the dwarf politics stuff, because, um, I was raised in that court, Maybe don't try and tell me how this works because you yeah. you've literally never been to a clan meeting. And yeah. Argon's like, you know, fair. You that, know, yeah, right. you know what? You're Actually, right. I haven't. Yeah, you're right. I've never been to a meeting. I didn't. Yeah. I, I the word meeting doesn't mean anything in Carvel Hall. We just all go yeah. to the bar at the end of the day. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, so they head to uh, they head back to Trondheim, and um, there's a lot of de- de- deliberations. We meet uh, the other prospective. Um, uh, Kings, uh, I just don't uh, maybe the any other of Grimes Um Nato is the one. Nato, Nato is the one who's like his biggest competition. Ralph Nader. Not Nato. Ralph Nader is in the competition. That is hilarious. I have no if idea you follow that American is. politics from twenty three years ago. Oh, okay. <laughs> Ralph Nader um, was a. Don't worry about it. It's a. It's a. It's a American election. There's though. one lady who finds Aragon really hot and is like giving him a lot of like side eye. She's also running. Uh, she, she is also running. She doesn't have a lot of support except from, like, the, the one other lady. But she casts the final vote. Uh, yeah, and yeah. During the, during the voting process, a swelden... Rock oh, Anuin. I was, I, I was mid-reading it. You took that from me. I'm so sorry. No, I just say, go for it. The whole thing. Just say it real fast. It'll roll off the tongue. Real probably. fast? I don't know. A swelden Rock Anuin. Yeah, great. Fuck yeah. You Dyslexia, fuck yeah. Gonna say the words wrong every fucking day no, now. Oh, you crushed it. Uh, well and uh, so us Weldon Rock on win. Uh, they try and attack Aragon. Yeah. And we they... find out that if you break those flameless lanterns that the dwarves use to light the paths. <laughs> they explode. They are bombs. Yeah. The dwarf, the dwarf <clears throat> city is full lined bombs. with bombs. Yeah, yeah. Don't hit it. <coughs> yeah. It, so... Here, here's, here's the thing. Here's what's insane about that. I don't think if you like <clears throat> knocked it or hit it or whatever, they don't just explode. Those daggers were magical, and I think that the daggers break the enchantments on it. Lanterns, they don't just like break willy nilly. So like, what if there's a landslide or like a tunnel collapse? Does the Again, tunnel collapse no magic. and then the lanterns just? No, I think that causing the ins- more of them to explode. No, I I don't think that they are triggered by pressure. I think that it was the magic daggers that cut through the magic that was keeping the heat and light for mm, informed. Okay. So unless you deliberately break them with magic, I do not think that they explode. Interesting. Okay. From my understanding of how they work, anyways. I'm just thinking like um, a landslide. If yeah, they are tumbling otherwise- over and over, those wards might get depleted over time and. I don't know. It's not a ward though. You, it's like it's like literally taking thing. It's like cutting through like a wire that is the enchantment. Like you have to like you can only be do it with magic is what I assume. But I love that people are explaining sure. Ralph Nader in the chat now. I don't know who that is, but sure, I <laughs> oh, that's appreciate so funny. it. Uh, yeah, so, um, so they do get attacked in the, Aragon does get attacked in the tunnels. We don't know right away that it's a swelled enough, uh, Rock Anuin, but it's but like. But we're pretty sure it, pretty immediately because sure. they're like, oh, these are, uh, yeah. they're daggers. Uh, yeah, Oric follows the trail, um, figures out that, um. It was them. It, it was them. And they, they banish the entire clan of Aswald and Rock Anuin until they decide to choose a new Grimstworth. They, um, but they don't like. Banish them. <clears throat> what I love about Oryx's plan here, 
to become king. They just ignore them. <laughs> he's like, we're not going to do anything. We're just going to pretend gonna you don't exist. Ignore you. You can't start a war because we're pretending you don't exist. That would be unreasonable. And everyone is like, yeah. Yeah. And just, <laughs> they start talking and no one answers them. And Orgon is like, why? They're saying such vile things. Why aren't they responding and to these like, vile insults? And Aragorn's like, oh, and this is one of those moments where like Aragorn is still an idiot because Aragorn, and I, it's for the audience's benefit. And I understand that as from a writer perspective, he's trying to use Aragorn as like the audience POV. But sometimes the way that he does that allows Aragorn to be dumb in Aragon a way that's is understandable. Just, Aragorn is, a, is, is, is impulsive. Yeah, yeah. And that, that, it, that definitely shows. But this moment's great where Aragorn's like, Oh, they're ignoring them on purpose because yeah. they just said that they were going to ignore them on purpose. Exactly. Two yes. seconds ago in front of me. Yep. <laughs> yeah. But it, it is it is a fun um it is a fun little way to deal with the conflict, right? Like it really shows Oryx's creativity in problem solving. Yes. And is He's I think what makes king. him a good king, right? Yeah. Like the the books justify his ascension to kingdom with the way that he handles the situation in front of him that we get to see. Yeah. It's not just off-page stuff. Mm -hmm. It is rather... And, and look, Aragon has less agency in this section of the book. It is his POV, but he's not the main character of this part of the narrative. Oric is. Yeah. And it is important for the audience to understand that just because Oric is Hrothgar's son, he is actually worthy of this title on his own. Yeah. And I thought that this sequence was a really did a really good job of selling to me that Oric deserved to win the vote. Absolutely. Not just that he should win the vote because he has Aragorn support, which I think is like cheap, or that he's Hrothgar's son, which I'm not a monarchist. Yeah, it, he deserves it because of his capabilities, and yeah. that was evident to me in the writing. And he didn't just accuse uh, Aswan as Aswan of like the attack without due evidence. Like he like yeah. he like followed all the processes to make sure that it wasn't in, in anger or um like in like an emotional turmoil. It was like we have we have definitive proof. Oh god, yeah, he Matt Murdock's the shit out of this. Oh yeah, situation. it's it's great. It's great. We Orc? including the choice awesome. to break two minds, but not the third. And he's like, so these two people, we broke into their minds. This one, haven't touched. You guys go, go ahead. For it. Have yeah. fun. You yeah. guys you guys wanna break somebody's spirit? Yeah, and Orc is like, all right, you know what? I think we're ready to vote. Which means they have like three days, they come together and they, they vote for a new king. Meanwhile, Aragon's like, hey Severe. Jeffrey Rat. Well, no, he can't you, hear you, her. He Severe, to, you gotta get here as fast as possible. Yeah, he scries so that he can he can tell her to to come meet him because they can't touch their minds. Aragon's like very alone for the first time since Safira has hatched. Yeah. Um, which was. Uh, she can just feel him in the back of his brain the way that Rand felt Alana for all those books. Oh, jeez, just a little tickle, you know. Um. So they we get a beautiful crowning ceremony. One of the most interesting a a elements of this book. Yeah, because gods are real. Or as close to as... The literal god of the dwarves comes in and is like, Auric, my bro! You can be king, dude. Puts a little crown on his head, boops him on the And seat. then Aragorn is like, was that god? And Auric's like, who knows? Might be. Probably. Yeah. But some some dwarves have... Because it, it's not a spell that like automatically does that. Because like two, there have been two kings. Or a king and a queen who did not get permission, but they were king and well, queen anyway. I don't know. They just weren't king and queen for very Here's long. Here's the thing. I don't know if um, uh, oh shit, what's what's the name of the? Havaldir. No, Is that's it not, not his name. It starts with a G. I'm almost positive. The I don't know. the name of the guy is here somewhere. Right? It's not here. Oh, it's not. No. Oh well, that's unfortunate. Um. It does not matter. Move on. Anyways. We have, we're at an hour and 43 minutes. The, it's I, I think that it's not that the god doesn't show up. It's that he doesn't, like, bless him with the crown and shit. That he just leaves. What? Well, there were two king or kings or queens or um, who didn't get, like, blessed, right? Yeah. I think it's that he what showed. I said. Yeah, you were like, he doesn't show up. But I no, 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 he doesn't. No, I, he he doesn't give them the blessing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, th I think that that's what it is. No, but well. I'm saying it's not a spell that like makes this happen. Where every right. single time it is the same. No, it's yeah. There is there have been two. That that's what I was saying. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Gotcha. Yeah. It's yeah. It is one of those weird things where you're like, 
is it a god? Is it not? Orc doesn't even know, but it's like the closest thing that we'll ever get. So yeah. Uh, so back. Oh no! And then so it ends with um, Safira walking forward, and she boops her snoot on the Isidermithrum, uh, and it reshapes. Well, not there. It's in the shape. It like recongeals yeah. into a single stone, but now it's got like even more beauty. Well, it's a little, it's like a darker red. So it's not the exact same that it was before. It is like slightly changed. She makes it the color of thorn. It's 2.0. Because 0. she's horny for that dragon D. Sure. Um, sure. She is. Oh, oh, 100%. She wants to get fertilized she wants to get it so on. bad. Yeah. And so uh, we cut back to Roran, who is uh, on his second mission. He serves under Redbeard, uh, and it goes well. And then Mar- uh, hit well, Martland's the hand first, gets cut off. The second one doesn't, because Martland has a, his right hand chopped off. Yes, he, yeah. he loses his hand. Um, it's still win, I guess. But. Yeah, yeah, but uh, <laughs> yeah, they head back to the Varden. One the thing that drives job. me crazy about this, what is that? Martland Redbeard is like, oh no, my hand, and Karn is like, I can reattach that with magic, and Martland Redbeard is like, leave me the fuck alone. Later. Yeah. I'm like, what do you what What do you mean later? I know. I know. So he loses Put your his, hand. He we loses. need every soldier. Put your hand back on. Yeah. Put your fucking hand back on, Martin Redbeard. Yeah. He doesn't. Um, <laughs> he doesn't. And uh, yeah, so uh, Roran gets put under a uh, different command. El, El Eric? Er, Elric? Eldric? El, uh, er, yeah. I don't remember his name. Um, we'll get to that in a second. Let's first talk about this. Aragon is like, okay, uh, hey, Naswada, we're done here. We did the we did the dang Arc thing. Ark is king. Yay us. Woot. Uh hey, can we go can we go see Ormus? And Naswat is like, who's Ormus? <laughs> and they're no, they're like, Can we go to Dwaldin Barden? Uh and uh Clarice is like, Can I go to the bathroom? Okay, now that she's gone, what's up everybody? How you doing? There ain't no Claris here. Uh so yeah, Aragon and uh Sephira fly back to Dwaldin Varden. Where they contact Ormus and are like, hey, do we have to come all the way to Ella's Mira or will you teach us over the mirror? And Ormus is like, nah, fuck that. You got to come all the way here. Uh, and Aragon's like, okay, well, that's a lot of time. But uh, people are going to die because of this, but I'm going to do it because I have to because you're being unreasonable. And uh, Shafika, his reaction was weird. Why didn't he want the hand reattached? He was trying to save Karn's energy in case something happened, right? He was like, this isn't as important as you having magic if something were to happen. And I can kind of understand that. Like, it is noble of him to say, but I would have I would have taken the healing personally in that situation. Uh, Ormus is not a fan of distance learning. No, Ormus uh, does not believe in work from home. Yeah. Uh, in the midst of uh, the COVID pandemic, Ormus was still going into the office every day. What? Uh, in the midst of the COVID pandemic, Ormus was still going into the office every day. Yes. Yeah, not yes. a fan of doing things uh, over Zoom. No, no. Um, which not is which is the true name for um, the spell that allows you to speak through mirrors. You go, Zoom, and then it. Yeah. Great. I uh, I love that. Christopher Paolini. You have an upcoming show on a streaming service I can't talk about because I'm on strike. You have an opportunity to do the funniest thing. And the funniest thing would be every time they talk by mirrors, have them say Zoom into the mirrors and that be the spell. Why? It would be... Skype. 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 Oh my God. Jesus Christ. Why? Skype Zoom. Yeah, Skype Zoom. Sure, that's the word in the ancient language. Yeah, Sakaipa so Zoom. Uh, it's that would be the it would be a funny joke. Please do that. It's drama copa. Sorry, it's already it's already canon. You can't. Why do you know that? What do you mean? Why do I know that? Why Why do you and I know these things? Why are we like this? How many times have I read Aragon? I don't know. Me neither. <laughs> I don't know. Me neither. <laughs> Sakaipa Zoom is funnier. Um, sure. Or yeah. Zoom Skypa. It's like Dream Stare or something like that. Yeah, I don't know. Um, it can be a different spell. Sure. Zoom Skypa. No, Drama Copa is um, to scry in a pool. That's not the mirror one. It, you can scry on any surface. Fine. You can scry in thin air if you want. It just takes way more energy. Fair. Um, all right. So uh, they go to Dwelden Varden. Um, 
Rorin. I got you, Joe. Rorin Burnham. is. Uh... Wait, did we skip what? over a whole? Oh, Rorin has to go on another mission. No, that's the one where Red ba- uh, Redbeard loses his hand. They fight some of the Laughing Soldiers because they're raiding the supplies, and it's just well protected. Um, right. Then he goes on another mission with um under Captain L- Elric or Edric or something. Yeah, and he uh keeps everybody alive. Yeah, kills it, 193 men. It doesn't yeah, it doesn't go well. I, it might be after No, it's before this cuz the the whipping happens up here. Um sorry, no, the notes we have aren't in the best order. Oh yeah. Uh, so I, he he they basically he go to a town, orders. but it's really cool cuz he goes to a town and he's mm-hmm. like, "Hey, like Eldric just wants us to keep charging <laughs> headlong into battle." Yeah. What if we put archers on rooftops and we, like, we thought this We use our surroundings. Through? Yep, yep. And then, you know, Edric doesn't, like... I can't remember his name. I'm going to call him Edric because I think that's what it is. Uh, he, you know, he's like, mm, kind of all, you know, get those archers did their job already, so get them off of the roofs and come help us over here. Yeah, um, he's really bad at his job. And Rorin is like, mm, no. Well, and they all kind of look at him and they're like, are we actually going to do that? And Rorin's like, we're going to do that eventually. Yeah. But for we're gonna now, be smart about it. We're, you know what? How about this? Archers, you're going to stay on the rooftops until you don't have arrows. And then you come down. Yeah. So that we're, we're kind of following what he said. Yeah. And Rorin's, most of Rorin's men survive and like barely anyone else does because yeah. Rorin is actually fucking smart. But because he disobeyed direct orders, Nazwada has to punish him because that is how military structure works. Yeah. Um, um, so he, she gives him the option of death. <laughs> Uh, 30 lashes and he can leave, or 50 lashes and he can stay with the Varden. Yeah. And he's like, well, 50 isn't that many more than 30, even though it's almost double. Uh, and so he he gets whipped. <laughs> uh, he gets whipped. And um, that sucks. Yep. And then the next morning he wakes up and Katrina is taking care of his back. And Naswata comes in and is like, hey, I need you to get on a horse. And Katrina's like, the fuck you do? And Rowan's like, no, it's fine. They I'm heal good. him. They heal him they, a little bit. They heal him more than they usually would, but not fully. <laughs> yeah. So that he can ride back into battle. But this time, he's in charge. And Katrina's like, what? Are, what? what is yep. this kangaroo court? Your I'm... honor! Yep. <laughs> My well... husband... <laughs> Just woke up. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, Katrina also tells Rorin that, like, she'll stay by his side as long as she can, but as soon as their baby is born, that she's taking it to safety. Yeah, fair. Right? Like, you, yeah, yeah. She's like, I want to be with you more than anything, but well, the what road, the baby needs is more is more than what I want. The road isn't the place for a baby. In the middle Katrina of a battle is not. <laughs> Katrina and Elaine should stay in Serta. Yeah, yeah. I, like, yeah. Al- Al- Elaine going with them to me is, she's like nine months pregnant, she, riding a horse in an army that's kicking up dust and yeah. all sorts of dung and shit. But she refuses to have anyone other than Gertrude. Oh, I get that. Thing. Gertrude can also stay in Serta with her. I mean, they need a healer. They have magic healers. Yeah, they only have like seven. I know. I just, I just, it's not a great, uh, it's not a great place for a nine-month pregnant woman to be. A hundred percent. Yeah. Which proves out. Um, yeah. But it's fine. Yeah. Uh, so they they do ride into battle again, this time yeah. with Urgles. Yeah. They win easily. Well, because um, there, there was a man in the Varden who was sentenced to death because he killed uh, Urgles around their campfire. Um, oh, there's and so much in this book. It's it. so hard to talk about this in three hours. I know, I know. Uh, but uh, Nazuada is trying to piece back to piece together a trust between the two races because she needs them to be able to work together and she thinks Rorin is the right person for the job. Yes. So, so, uh, they, they... They go beat up on some Empire people. Yeah, they, they go fuck them up. And, and they, when Rorin and... turns around, there are some Urgles who are torturing men. Yes, yes. And so Rorin is like, stop that kill them and then what the fuck is his name um uh yarbog yarbog is like nah fuck that i want to torture humans and roran's like well no well he doesn't say i want to torture humans yes he he does he says i want to make them wiggle with the tip of my yeah and roran is like well you wouldn't torture and he wants to do that okay i I just mean the humans part because roran is like well you wouldn't do that to people of your own race and yarbog is like i mean yeah yeah when we die we want a chance to prove that sure if they were also fighting urgles he would also want to torture them but they are only fighting humans yeah until the end of the series i'm just saying that it's not specifically directed towards the humans right now it is like a thing that the urgles believe 
Like, if you're defeated, you have, like, one more chance to die honorably if you can withstand pain and, and torture, which is, is fucked up. The, the, the Argos got some sure, fucked that's up a, things. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it, it is an important distinction. I don't right? think it is here, because I think that the Urgles do it to each other for a different reason than Yarbog is enjoying doing it to the humans. And Why I think, do you think that? Because I think that Yarbog enjoys the fact that humans do not withstand torture the same way, because culturally they don't have a reason to. And I think that he respects an Urgle when he does it, and I think that it is for personal pleasure when he does it to a human. Maybe. I think they are fundamentally different I think from you, his point of view. I think you can totally read it that way, but I don't think that that is, like, explicit in the material. Um, and, and so... Nicholas Cardio says, yeah. shout out to the flying ship made out of grass that appears to people. Yeah, it does yeah, appear to Roar and Katrina, yeah, which is like, so oh, funny. Yeah, like, oh, that's fucking weird. Um, yeah, I... I, I I, I just disagree with what... I, I think that the way that they are enjoying it, they would not enjoy it in the same way if they were doing it to an Urkel. Yeah, and I, I disagree, and the text leaves that open to interpretation, for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but Roran uh, tells him to stop, and Yarbok says, no, I'm not going to listen to you. So, and so it's grease time! Right! <laughs> it's grease in time. Uh, yeah, they uh, oil themselves up with bare fat, hot, uh, and they Which, wrestle. like, why do they have that with them? I don't know. They're maybe like it's ready for cooking? to. Oh, maybe they cook with bear fat. Okay. Maybe I. It just seems like a very difficult fat. It's like to taking obtain. a stick of butter and like. Yeah, but butter. I get how they get enough of it. Bear fat. It's not like they're killing a ton of bears. You know what I mean? You know, maybe. Maybe. Maybe there are a lot more bears in Alagasia than I think. Um, but yeah, they they smear up with bear fat and then they wrestle. They wrestle. Yep. Roaring wins, but. Barely. Um, it's 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 hilarious. This reading this scene is one of my favorite parts of this book because it reminds me so much of my youth in Alberta. That's weird. What like steer wrestling? The whole like steer? idea of like yeah. What's a steer? How are you from Alberta? How how is it possible? You, you we the, the we we talked about this yesterday, but we were underneath steer wrestling in the grandstand. Steer wrestling? Yeah. You mean the chuck wagon races? No, the the prelude to that. The, like, the rodeo? Yeah. Steer wrestling. It's called a fucking rodeo. A rodeo is... A, a, the rodeo... A lot of events happen in the rodeo. Steer wrestling is one of them. What is steer wrestling? It's where you wrestle steers. I don't know how to what explain... What is a steer? It's a, it's, a, it's a cow. It's like a male cow. Okay. You take like a like a you like baby so. cow, a baby a baby like male cow, and then it like runs at you, and you like try and like rope its legs, and you wrestle it to the ground. That is the rodeo. Okay, sure, <laughs> sure. I have never watched this happen. <laughs> I like. I just love. I love that you have like the least Calgary experience of Calgary. Yeah, because I didn't go watch men wrestle cows i just had no interest in it it's what we did for fun (laughs) sounds super fun it you know what it is it's a necessary skill that's why it's part of the rodeo is because a part of being a cowboy Uh is it's a skill that you have to have to be able to take down a steer safely without hurting it or getting hurt yourself like, the goal of it isn't to hurt the steer. I know. It is to be able to do that so that on the farm, if something bad happens, you can end that situation without losing a very valuable cow, right? Cows are expensive and, you know what I mean? So, yeah. like, it's, 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 the, uh, most of the rodeo skills are things that you actually do need to know on the farm. Yeah. I just never did it or watched it. <laughs> That's wild. I... I can't believe you're a young Canadian of the Calgary Stampede and you don't know what steer wrestling is. Yeah, I, I'm sure I'm not the only one. Unreal. <laughs> sure. Anyway, so this reminded me of my childhood. Uh, and Roran, uh, he's not allowed to use his weapons. He's given the option to use his shield and helmet. But he's like, they'll slow like, me nah, down. Not worth so it. Bare hands and Urgle. Uh, because the legend of Roran's strong armor has to grow bigger and bigger every day. Because <laughs> why not? Uh... This earns him a lot of respect with the Urgles and saves yep. the relationship between the Urgles and the Vard. Yep, yeah, does what knows what it wants. Aragon and Sephira go to Brom, or nope. to Ormus, to learn about Brom. Yeah, yeah. And Aragon is like, why didn't you tell me about my dad? 
And, and Saphira's like, tell like, him. Can we, Saphira's can we like, can him? we please stop this bullshit? Yeah, 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 yeah. This has gone on for too long. Yeah. And Ormus is like, well, I wasn't allowed to tell you unless not knowing put you in danger. And I think the burning blades count. Here's what I will say. I am glad that the, the reason why they didn't tell him was, was the oaths. oaths. Yeah. Because if it wasn't oaths, this would be incredibly stupid. Yeah. You'd be like, why would you let him not Why know? would you do yeah. this? Yeah. But because it is oaths. Mm-hmm. I'm fine with it yeah. because Brom is a difficult person and you know what I mean? Yep. Like it works because they, they didn't have a choice. Absolutely. And otherwise Safira would have told him because yeah. she knows how much it hurts Aragon to think that he's, um, Morzan's son. Yeah. And, and honestly, like Safira making the oath, I, I think that Safira learns a lesson in this, right? Where like Safira makes the oath before she knows what the information is. Yeah. And it's something that I don't think she would do again. Mm-hmm. And so I, I do like, it shows like the growth in her in this. Um, but we, we find out that Aragon is, in fact, Brom's son. Yeah. 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 There's, like, a little memory that he gets to watch. Yeah. Um, like, a little movie, I guess, of Brom talking. A little talking, short film. Yeah, talking to him. Um, we find out, you know, that um, Aragon's mother, uh, Selena, like, how, how Brom... Evil as fuck. Her me- well, p- potentially. We don't really know. Like the- She was at least evil for a little bit. She did some fucked up things for sure. Yeah. Um. And but it's 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 definitely a lot. It it's left fairly ambiguous, right? Because even Ormus is like, look, love, love blinds people yeah. to to even their greatest flaws. Um. He's like, do I know what is true and what is not about your mom? No. And I'm not gonna pretend to. And try not to let that like darken these memories. Um, cause he, he, he gets this, uh, incredible, he gets to see affairs of his mom and he gets to see Brom talking to him as his dad. And like, I can't imagine what that would like mean to him. Right. Like, yeah, it's beautiful. I really like the scene. Uh, I think that Ormus is back, telling this backstory of their relationship is very cute. The scene, the Brom memory scene is really nice. Uh, but also the, the thing about it that I appreciated is that Aragon straight up says to Ormus and Glader, I I cannot trust you because of this. And Ormus pushes back, but I don't I do not think that Ormus and Glader by the end of this scene fully win Aragon back over. Mm-hmm. I don't think that he trusts them the same way. And yeah. I think that um even though it is oaths and even though it is what it is, I think that there is an element of and I, I, it's not explored because Ormus and Glader die at the end of the book. But I do think that there is an element of too many secrets lead to a fracture in trust between them here. And I think that it is a really important lesson for Aragorn to learn as well because mm-hmm. he has sworn oaths. Yeah. And he's been forced into positions where he kind of has to. But, like, I think it really sh- highlights to him the the hurt that you can inflict based on it or you know yeah. like like when it is it actually necessary because i think brahm had Zephira and and Ormus and glader swear unnecessary oaths in a lot of ways you know even with brahm being like a rider you know i i understand he didn't want to share that with aragon right away but like brahm was determined to keep his secret to the detriment of his own son and that is so sad yeah. And I think that it's more of a moment for Aragon learning that than you know, than being like I can't trust Ormus and Gladier, but more of like a uh, like when you should actually swear oaths of that nature yeah. that are binding in a way that you literally can't break them. Yeah, no, I agree. It's yeah. it's a it's a really good scene that allows for Ormus and Aragon because Saphir and Gladier are dragons, and it's hard to really put a like finger on what their relationship is. They're so foreign to my brain and, like, what that means for them. But Saphira and um, Orm- or uh, Aragon and Ormus, I can kind of understand a relationship between those two people in terms that I can understand. And their relationship becomes a more mature connection between two people here. Yeah. Rather than just being the, like, master-student relationship that it was previously, where Ormus doesn't... Ormus doesn't exist as a person in Aragon's sphere. He is, like, a library. Yeah. And this is where Ormus becomes a real full person to Aragon and has flaws a little bit more readily available to Aragon to like relate to. I think that's also part of the reason why Galater gives them his Eldunari because mm-hmm. of that shift. 100%. Yeah. Otherwise, I don't I don't know if that happens. No, I, I agree. Um, 
But we don't know about that yet because first, he needs a sword. Uh, yep. So Aragon goes to the Minoa tree because Solombom told him to in book one. And he's like, hey, I need a sword. And the tree's like, well, he knows he needs bright steel. He goes to Runan, and Runan is like, yeah, man, even if I could make a sword, I don't have the material for yeah. it. And Aragon is like, okay, bet. So he goes to the Manoa tree, um, and he they, tries talking like, to it. attack it. Well, yeah, they try talking to it. Well, no, they it. sit there for a while, and then Saphira gets bored and is like, nah, fuck this. And yeah. she starts lighting the tree on fire. How dare someone ignore a dragon? And so she slices up the tree and burns And all it. of the elves run over, and they're like, what are you doing? Yeah, and the Manoa tree literally attacks them and is like... Uh, what are your names so I know who's gonna die? And they're like, okay, but wait, we're like the last, we're like the last hope for Algazia. So if, if you got some bright steel, like now would be the time to to let us know. And the Minotaur tree's like, yeah, I got some, but uh, I'm gonna have to get something in return. And everyone's like, yeah, whatever you want. And then the Minotaur tree gives him the steel and uh, doesn't respond to them again. Do you think um, he just, like, can't get boners from now on? Well, Aragon feels a twinge of discomfort in his lower belly. Maybe. Wait, 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 wait. Wait. Maybe the Manoa tree uh -huh. took his gallbladder. Why? You can live without it. Sure, but why would the Manoa tree need it? Maybe she took his appendix. In your lower belly? Yeah, that's where your appendix, appendix is, like, up here. Your appendix is right here. It's not that low, is yeah, it? it is. I always thought it was like under, like, like near your waist. That's my waist. That, oh, I'm, I mean, I'm, my finger is I thought on like my waist. lower belly. I is get like... that I have more belly than you, but my finger is on my waistline. Really? Yeah. Because I think your waist would be here. So then I'm on. I'm pointing at my lower belly. But your appendix is right here. I thought it was higher up. No. Uh, I mean, maybe I'd... she took his appendix. She's like, look, I want, I want an organ, but I don't want you to die, so I'll take the appendix. I, I'm like, maybe the Manoa tree put some, put, put some like seeds in Aragon, so when he like takes a shit somewhere, what? it, the, the, that the forest oh. can spread. <laughs> Aragon becomes a bumblebee. How does that bumblebee? take something from him though? Um, Shafika Idris says, my thought is that he can't have kids, but hope I'm wrong. Yeah, that would be a weird one. His that testicles aren't in his stomach though. No. Unless elf testicles are in their stomach and his balls have moved. Could you imagine? Maybe during the the blood drain, his testicles like reverted back up into him. That would be wild. Yeah. When elves go through puberty, their balls don't descend. Okay, hang on, hang on. It's canon. I, found, I wanna just, the, okay, wait. Uh, maybe please this is great the... podcast content. Uh, Clars Polaris is leafing through a book. Uh, trying to find... It says, will you give me what I want? Yeah. So it's not like taking or giving... Like, I don't... Yeah. Yeah, so a uh, slight twinge in his lower belly. Um, and she says, will you give me what I want? Uh, but I, we don't know what the Manoa tree wants. No. We're going to ask Paulini on Thursday. Or maybe <laughs> like, the answer... Hey. Is in Murtag. Yeah. This is on shelves now, not a sponsor. We're not being paid to show this off. I'm just excited just about it. it. We just love it. We just love it. It's been a long time. It's been 12 years since there was a book in this series. And look, it's thick. There's stuff that happens She's in it. Boy. Listen to that book sound. You can knock somebody out with that. Woo! Yeah, I, 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 I'm super curious what it is. I think I think it'll be answered like... I think it was his appendix or his gallbladder or both. Maybe half of his liver. Maybe the Manoa tree turned into a tree because it was an alcoholic. No, and we it know needed why the tree is the tree. Okay, but that's the story of why the tree is the tree. But maybe the truth is that that story was hiding the fact that the tree was an alcoholic and needed a liver transplant. And so it turned into a tree until it could get a liver. And now it has a working liver and so it can turn back into an elf. Why didn't it just ask any of the elves around it for a liver transplant? Maybe you can't liver transplant an elf. You need a human-elf hybrid. Why? Because elves... Because it was before the bonding of the dragons and the elves. Oh, wait, wait. Maybe elves can't regrow their livers the way humans can. And so you can't take half an elf's liver because the elf will die. But because Aragon is half human, his liver will regrow. And so you can't take half of his liver. Sure. Aragon just needs to not drink alcohol for six months. <laughs> I'm just saying it's possible. Sure. It's possible. Sure. 
So anyway, they have the bright steel. And so uh, we get maybe my favorite moment in the series. I know the uh, Arangi bl- or, or, or Blood Garden. Agati Blood Run. A, rangy a gay one. time in the blood garden uh, is Clarus' favorite, um, but uh, this is maybe my favorite scene in the series, which is uh, Runan, and uh, Runan, like, Patrick Swayze ghosts Aragon into making a sword. Yes. And I really hope that when they do it for the TV show, it is as, like, intimate and sensual as Ghost, and I hope that they play over, like, the makeup of the sword, like, oh... My love, my darling, I've hungered for your touch. Jesus. A lot. DMCA. About to get taken down. Um, And he's just making a sword. He's like swinging. He's all sweaty and shirtless. And he's swinging a hammer. And you just like. And while the children are watching, there's literally two children watching this whole thing. So slow, and he's just hammering that steel into shape. The and children. Runan is just like sitting in the corner, like fucking like feeling his vibes. And the kids are watching this, like, what the fuck is happening in the forge? Yeah, so no, I, slowly I hate all of that. and time um, clang, clang. Time can do so much. So the reason that they have clang, to like bond brain wise is because Runan uh, swore an oath that she will <clears> never <throat> make a sword ever again. But she's like, if I possess Aragon to make a sword. That doesn't count. And Aragon's like, well, no, I'm um, actually. And she's like, no, shut the fuck up. Do you want a sword or not? <laughs> Are you still mine? Because I need your love. Oh, Runan, baby. You know that I need your love. <laughs> You're not enjoying me today? I'm just waiting for you to finish. I thought I was being entertaining, <laughs> and now I feel like it wasn't. <laughs> I'm just giving you shit. You sang that beautifully. Wow, I feel very disrespected. <laughs> uh, Runan is like, Aragon, if you try and logic me out of making you a sword, I will fucking kill you. Um, so Aragon shuts up, and it's very funny. <laughs> what? There's nothing worse than when you are singing and your audience pulls out their phones and just starts looking at their phones. What was I supposed to do? That hurt on like a visceral, like. You're trying to be funny. I'm trying to be funny. Level. But you think you're funny and you think I'm not funny. I think you're funny. I just when you're singing to someone and they pull out their phone. You're not singing to me. I was. I was singing about like my love, and I was like, it's fine. You're singing to them. I was singing to everybody, but the only audience member I could see pulled out their phone mid-performance. And that, to me, is... That is the heartbreak of live theater. We've all been there. It's fine. We've all seen oh, it. Oh, wow. Where someone in the front row is like... I just had, like, a PTSD moment, thanks to you. That's great. This is fun. I didn't realize that theater gave you PTSD? When an audience member pulls out a phone in the middle of my song. Oh, God. When, what song was that? When, when did that happen? Almost every show I've ever done since cell phones became a thing. Well, that is very unfortunate, and I'm well, so it, it, sorry. If you run a show long enough, somebody will do some... Or, like, phones will go off. It, it happened when I was doing Shrek all the fucking time. Oh, yeah. Like, people's phones just go off in the middle of the show, and I you're like... I can't remember the last I time... this flower... Right over there. I whip my hair back and forth. I whip my hair. And you're like. I cannot remember the last time I was in a show and someone's phone did not go off. I mean, I've definitely had performance where it doesn't, but I haven't had a run of a show where it hasn't happened. No, I mean, like, when we go and see shows. Oh, yeah. There's always somebody in the fucking audience. And I'm like, my guy. Like, every time. Yeah. (laughs) God, yeah, I don't know why people are so fucking stupid and can't turn off their cell phones. I don't, I really don't understand why it's hard. I don't know and why like, people have their ringers on all the time. Well, and this is going to sound mean, but if you're old and you don't know how to use your technology, don't have it. Well, Stop making it everybody else's problem and just I, figure it out. Being old isn't an excuse to be stupid, in my opinion. Uh, if you're going to be in public, figure out how to be in public around people without inconveniencing everybody most people are capable of it yeah but like, fuck your I'm, dementia i'm 60 isn't an excuse to be dumb i'm sick and i have dementia so i should I am not, not i should not about go about in society dementia. well you're like 
old people. No, no, no. But I'm saying that the, the number of times that I meet people who are elderly, uh-huh. who have all of their faculties, uh-huh. who use that as an excuse to just not treat other people with respect, oh, or, or, or but, who use yeah, their... But... The fact that they are older as in a reason to be disrespectful to waiters, baristas, uh, theater That's staff. That's not what you were just talking about. You're talking about homes. Thing. No, but I think it's the same thing. I don't think that, I do not think that getting older gives you the excuse to inconvenience the people around you by, with, with whatever your behavior is. Mm-hmm. Age is not an excuse in that. Yeah, I just, I don't think that like treating people a certain way is the same as like, not understanding I how one thousand percent think an that respect. Works. No, but but you turn turn off your ringer at the theater. Oh, I agree. It's respect, I and agree. I don't think that aging gives you the right to disrespect other people's space and time. Yeah, I agree. Um, I I just don't. So yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I I don't think that those things are uh, like I don't see those things being related to one another. But I do agree with you. I think they're both respect, and I think that they're both um. I, I do. I, I think they're very tied together. And mm-hmm. and I see the thing, the reason why I think that they're tied together is because the people that do one typically do the other. The, the oh, okay. crossover and the people who are rude to waiters and who leave their phones on at the theater. How do you know that? Because I go to a lot of theater and I spend a lot of time in restaurants. Yes, but you don't, you can't see people's faces in the audience. You're not like, that's the guy whose phone went off when you go to dinner and you're serving him pasta. No, but they've got a vibe. Sure. You know, you know sure. exactly who I'm talking about. Sure. Like men who are like 50 to 65 Uh who are a golf shirt and jean shorts to the theater with New Balance sneakers, leave their phones on. Great. So just wear Skechers instead of New Balance and you're good. Straight up. (laughs) Or dress better. You have New Balance shoes. No, I don't. Yeah, aren't the purple ones New Balance? No, they're Saucony. Okay, sure. I don't know, fucking know. Look, New Balance are comfortable <laughs> shoes, but if a man is wearing a golf shirt, jean shorts, and New Balance sneakers, he leaves his phone on at the theater and you he doesn't tip You heard it here, good. folks. You heard it here, folks. I Look, I am not one of those people that wants to classify people by race, which is what a lot of waiters will do when it comes to tipping, but I will <laughs> but judge people Lacoste based on their- if you're wearing a Lacoste golf shirt. <laughs> if you're wearing a Lacoste- No, no, Lacoste is too nice. If you're wearing like a Top Golf or like a a knockoff, no, no, it's got to be a golf brand. Lacoste is like preppy. It's got to be a golf <laughs> brand that does the like wider middle because they all have a belly. <laughs> with the jean shorts, your wife is dressed in a nice dress, but you're in jean shorts and you're wearing New Balance sneakers with white socks that are rolled up halfway through your ankle. You are not going to tip me well, and I know that, and that is fine. How many times have we gone out, and I I wear a dress and you wear jean shorts? <laughs> Yeah, but I usually have a nice shirt on, and like I'll wear like my I'll wear like my black leather shirt. Sure, you're wearing like a button up instead. I of wear. A... Je- it's not the jean shorts that's just, the problem. I'm... You have to have the full outfit. I also wear ankle socks so that I don't have the weird white sock up to the mid calf look of that looks bad, gentlemen. Yeah, it makes you look shorter. It's, it's not a, a good look. One. Yeah, it's you have to have one. all four pieces. It's a four oh, piece outfit. Four piece outfit. If you if you have three of the four pieces, but you if you have like nice socks on, but you have the rest of the three pieces, you're probably going to tip me well. But if you have all four of those things together at once, it is the infinity gauntlet of me getting twelve percent. And if you have the sunglasses upside down on the back oh of your head, my God. I'm getting zero percent tip, and I know that. That's I. That's what I don't get. That one. I I have to I wear shorts a lot because I overheat and I'm uncomfortable in public, I know, I know. right? Just and so shit. yeah, I wear jean shorts because they're com- they're more comfortable because I overheat. Mm-hmm. But a I tip twenty five percent most places we go, mm-hmm. and b I'm never rude to waiters. <laughs> no. Because I no. don't wear a Except golf shirt, jean girl- shorts, white Wait. socks, and New Balance sneakers. Except for that one girl who was like, the kitchen said they didn't put pepper on your steak. <laughs> what? The girl who was like, no, the kitchen said they didn't put pepper on your steak. Okay, that was a, that it, that was, that was a once in a lifetime experience. Oh, I know. Trust me, I was there and I was present s- for looking it. Looking at the woman going, there, that's, this is black pepper, yes? And she goes, Yes. You can see it. But you're telling me that the kitchen says they didn't put pepper on the steak. That's what they said. But you and I are both looking at pepper right now, yes? And she's like, yes. And I was like, uh, I would like to speak to your manager. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was good times. Good Sorry, times. what was the show we're doing? <laughs> uh, so we were talking about the inheritance cycle, about Brissinger. Um, that might be the weirdest tangent we've ever gone on. 
Um, so they make a sword. I don't even know how long that was. They, 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 there's oh, this they, they, beautiful they, they, scene. Oh, they do, they have a sex scene where they make a sword together. It's not a sex scene. I they never get, read he it polishes, sexy. Runon helps Aragon polish his metal hard and long. This never came off as sexy to me, but I think that's a Oh, it's problem. not at all. I'm just making a joke for the, <laughs> because this is a comedy podcast about books. And uh, we got to put Smut Corner in here somewhere, so... You know, the, like, 10,000-year-old elf and the 16-year-old boy for Smut Corner really just... Who do you think is older, Angela or Runon? That's a, Runon. See, that's a tough question, right? Runon. Only because Runon remembers the time before the elves were bonded to the dragons. Is Angela not? I don't know. Angela is more of a question mark. We at least get an idea of Runon's age. I do not know how mm. old Angela is. Um... <laughs> Nick Walker says, I had headphones in the voting booth, and the person next to me definitely heard singing. I love that. Thank you for voting. Uh... I love that in a way I made it into a voting booth today. You did. You did. I. It is the one thing about not living in the States anymore. Yeah. Classic nerdy ageism. It's not ageism. I will not judge you for being old. I just will not give you a pass on treating people with kindness because you are old. Yeah. I... Love old people. Mm -hmm. I, that sounds like the, like, I have black friends excuse. It, <laughs> I love old people. I, I don't want people to think that I think that, like, you should die at 60. No, they're just giving you shit because it's come up in other book clubs before. I, I know, but, I, but I'll stand by it. Like, it's the same no, with Cat Swain. You don't get to be rude because you're old. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Fudgy, don't worry. I have read all the Narnia books, so we I will haven't. not book club them. I've never read a Narnia book. Any of them? I thought no. you said you read the first one. No, I've seen the movies. Oh, wow. I've okay. never read a book. All right. You've never read a book. In the Narnia series. <laughs> I have never read a book. I heard that C.S. Lewis was Jesus shit, and I was like, oh, I'm good. Oh, it is so religious. Yeah. So I, I just, it was one of those things where, like, I was at a very, because my parents wanted like me to go to church. It's like the opposite of his dark materials. <laughs> yeah, which I loved, because we killed God, and I love that. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a good time. Yeah, they're fine books. I had fun with the fantasy elements of them, but like they really didn't stick with me and I never reread them, so they weren't that great. Uh, Fudgy Vamp says you can never read Narnia because Smut Corner would be canceled and then no one would watch. Why? Because they're all children. No, Prince Caspian and Aslan fuck, for sure. They're children. Aslan is an adult and yes. so is Prince Caspian. I thought Prince Caspian was 17. Okay, in the movie, he is like 30 years old and has a beard. The actor is. He's he hot. does not have a beard. He's hot. He's very hot and he fucks Aslan He's for the... sure. Isn't he the same guy from Aslan Shadow and Bone? Aslan takes Caspian to Pound Town. Uh, yeah, it's Ben Barnes. That's the one. That's the one. Yeah. One of the most attractive people on the planet right now. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, uh, Aragon gets shiny new sword. It's a really fucking cool scene. I can't like... <laughs> I don't... <laughs> uh, Shafika, it isn't Mighty Nine that hate... Uh, or Bl Bl Blige Monkey. It's not the Mighty Nine that hate old people. It's uh, Vox Machina. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Vox Machina hate old people. Yeah. Um... Yeah, Aragon gets Unless Mighty Nine hate old people later, but they don't hate old people as much as Vox Machina did yet where I'm at in it. Oh, you're like halfway through. Um, so Aragon names his beautiful blue sword um, Brisinger. And he they, we, we're not really sure why, but it lights up. And Renan is like, well, maybe it's because you found its like true name in the ancient language or because mm -hmm. because you were the one who made the sword that some of your magic is like imbued in it, which is like, a, you know, a really cool it's connected idea. connected to your soul, boy. Yeah, but it's like a cool moment that Aragon finds incredibly frustrating. We've made after. a lot of jokes. I want to be very clear. The making of the sword, I made a lot of jokes about it. I want to take one second here to say this is one of my favorite scenes in the series. I think that the the care and attention to detail in the making of the sword, what it means for Aragon, mm -hmm. everything about Runon and Aragon making this blade is one of my favorite things in this entire series. And it is very good. I just wanted to make jokes about it because this is a podcast where I'm trying to have fun and make it like entertainment. But I, joking aside, this is one of the best parts of this whole series. Yeah. It's so good. The specificity of it really blew me away the first time I yeah. read it too because I have no fucking idea how to make a sword but I was like, uh, yeah, yeah, whatever you say. Like, this all seems legit. I I love this whole sequence. I love Runon having to do it because she knows that it's the right thing but she has this oh that she's trying to get around. I, everything about it, I this is one of my favorite parts of this and I I just, I made a lot of jokes so I want to say that no, on no, the record. No, no, that's fair, that's this, fair. This rock. You did open socks. by saying it's probably, it's like one of your favorite moments in the series. I think it is my so. favorite moment in the series. That yeah. isn't like a fight. Yeah. Yeah. Fair. Yeah. 
Um, so, uh, Aragorn's got a new sword. They go back to Ormus and uh, Glader uh, before they leave to go back to the Varden. And Ormus is like, yeah, so the dragons have this organ called, or sorry, no, Glader explains. Uh, we've got this heart of hearts. Um, and fun fact, you can put your consciousness into this stone and barf it out to give to somebody, um, which would then give you power over the, the dragon inside. Eldenari. Eldenari, the heart of hearts. One thing about Brissinger that I think elevates this book above the first two, in my opinion, mm -hmm. is this is the book where this series becomes very unique yeah. and steps away from the um, roots in which it was inspired by. Mm -hmm. I think Christopher Paolini's called a plagiarist a lot online, uh, mostly because I've been like looking at reviews of these books as we do book club. Mm -hmm. As I usually do, I look at like what other people think before we talk about things. Um, yeah. Or after we've talked about them, and I'm curious if people agree with me. And there are people who straight up just call him a plagiarist for Aragon and the series. Uh, I don't fully see it. I do definitely think that in the first two books, there's a lot more inspiration. Uh, but, but even so, we've talked about how it's an it, he takes a creative twist on it. I, I agree. But I think that this is the book that introduces a lot of very unique concepts that take the... Um, <laughs> did Clarice just casually tie her hair on her neck? She does that sometimes when she has braids. I don't know why. Um... <laughs> I get distracted. This is where the book series, in my opinion, um, forges its own identity. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is partially through the attention to detail and things like the Fortune of Zarok. Yes. Or uh, the Fortune of Brissinger. Brissinger. Uh, the Eldunari, which is a concept that I think is very interesting and unique. Yeah. And has implications in this world. There's things like this. People live in soul gems in many different things. Mm -hmm. But the implications of the Eldenari within this world and the way that it functions in Galbatorix's power and adding to the risk of it. Um, I, I think the way that uh, Paolini pairs the, re the, the inner monologue about the relationships the three main characters have to the Varden, Naswada, Aragon, and, Mert er, and Roran. Mm -hmm. Uh, Roran and Katrina's relationship and its presence within this book. I think there, this is the book where Christopher Paolini steps out of the shadow of his influences mm -hmm. and really forges something that I think stands on its own. Yeah. And I, it's why I love Brissinger so much. It's why, like, coming back to it, I was so quickly reminded from the Razak fight on and through the Sloan stuff. The Sloan... There's not a lot of books that interrogate a uh, main character's morality like that. Yeah. And so I, I do, I think that like you can call Aragon, the first book, a very influenced novel written by a child. Sure. I still think it's very fun and I enjoy reading it, but I don't think that you can make, you can levy that complaint towards Brissinger as much. I think that this world is fully its own thing. The Urgle relationships with the Varden is very cool and yeah. I don't read a lot like that. I, I really do. I think that this is where he steps out of the shadow of what he was influenced by and forges his identity as a fantasy creator rather than just a writer within the genre. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. Well, I think one of the things that this book does, very that, that, that this series does really well, that is very clever, that is lacking in a lot of series, especially something like Wheel of Time. You've got your main character, Aragon, who's very powerful. And is fighting very powerful people. But okay, you yeah, have... yeah. I was saying he's not he's not uber powerful within the world, but he is very powerful compared to a normal person. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But then you have Rorin, who is a powerful, very powerful. <laughs> powerful dude, but fighting normal people. Mm -hmm. He's not fighting with magic in the same way. He has to be creative with his strategy without the use of, of magic and dragons that Aragon has. Yeah. You have two people fighting on very different fronts of the same battlefield within a series. And I think that it is one of the strengths, like the true core strengths of the series is having those two different perspectives. And Nasuwada bringing the political side. Yeah. In, in a yeah. way that like, I her, the way that Nasuwada handles Orin, I really wish Orin and Oric's names were not so similar. But, fair, uh, fair. <laughs> for, for my brain. But uh, the way that she handles Orin, I think really shows a depth with which Christopher Paolini interrogates intellectually the politics of the world that he created. For sure. And I, I think that the I think that Nasuada's chapters are um we, we don't talk about them as much because not as much happens in them where because they are really about her maneuvering, mm -hmm. but thematically they're very important and I think they're really well written. I think Nasuada yeah. 
They give a a great structure to the fun stuff that everyone else is doing because you have a smart person who's very capable who's trying to guide everything and push the story forward. In terms of, um, in terms of, like female fantasy characters, I think Nasuada is a unique character. Mm -hmm. Like I love Arya. I do, but Arya is a trope within the fantasy genre yep. of the like very athletic, fit, hot elf lady who helps. Who like, is aloof. Toriel is uh, from the Hobbit movies, fits into the same like mold that she does. The, the, there is that elf lady who's super strong and helps the good guy, and he falls in love with her because she's got elven beauty. That is a thing that has been done before, mm-hmm. but Nasuada's political leadership in the last two books, I think, makes her a unique character within the fantasy space that's written very well Yeah, if, by a male author. And I, I will say this. I think that in terms of the writing of women in this series... Christopher Paolini writes women really well. Apparently he had a lot of feedback on Arya in the earlier books from mm-hmm. his sister and his mother. Because yeah. um, she she was a different... She, she had a different vibe. Well, um, and, but even... But I, I, I love where they settled. Bringing up his sister, like, Angela is a very unique female character for a fantasy book, right? Inspired by his sister. The... I, I think that you get into... You get a lot of women. You get, like, the, the pains of birth. Yeah. And you get the the meaning of um, the we get into like the cleft lip later with uh, Elaine's child, but the there's a lot of elements of how Christopher Fellini writes women that I think are is unheralded, and, I, and I, I think he does a better job of it than most fantasy men writers male writers that I read. I will I will agree. Even though Katrina is a very simplistic character in a lot of ways, she is the you know wife of a soldier. She loves him dearly, and she wants. She, she her wants are very feminine in a lot of ways, right? She she, she you know they're having a child. She has this. Um, yeah, but when the leader of the Varden goes, I need you to go to war. Katrina goes no, and Roran has to like hold her back. Yeah, but that's what I mean. Katrina's about to take her earrings out and beat the shit out of Nasuada. Katrina (laughs) could have been an absolutely nothing burger of a character that they Mm -hmm. have to go save to go kill the Razak, and and then it doesn't matter. The fact that like Katrina is interesting throughout this series even without really being given anything to do but the conversations mm-hmm. that she has with Rorin like the, the sweetness his... of their relationship is yeah, really nice yeah 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 because it's in contrast to the lack of romance in Aragorn's plotline and yeah. his pining yeah. yeah yeah it's I think it's really well done I don't um, know I, I just think a lot of male writers have female characters in their books poorly and I think that this I, I don't think Chris Pauline does I, I think yeah. that it is I think he writes women really well, and I think all of the women have a point of view mm-hmm. and are very var- varied in their personalities. Mm-hmm. Like, I, 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 Nasuada, Katrina, Angela, and Arya are four very, very distinct different. women. Yep, and Safira. In a way that all of the Aes Sedai are the same. Well, and so Saf- <laughs> Safira as well. Yeah, Safira as well. Like, very well written, and, and obviously she's a dragon. She's like a different race of being, but is still written in a fascinating way that, and, it, you know, it, and I think that the dragon's personalities are all incredibly unique as well. I, like, I just, yeah, I think it's, I think it's incredibly well done. I don't know, um, I don't know Chris Paolini, obviously, but I would hazard a guess that he has a very healthy relationship with his sister and mother. Yeah, you know I know what I mean? assume like, so. Like, the way that he writes women, and I, I'm willing to bet that, I, I don't know if he's married, if he is married to a woman. I think he I don't is even know a dad straight. now. But if he is married to a woman, I have a feeling he is a very healthy, just because of the way that he views the lens of women. Yeah. And we see Naswat as POV. He's like married with children. It's crazy. I think, I mean, it's not that crazy. I know, it's just crazy because... <laughs> We're also... I, I, we are we are all of that age, but this, it feels, yeah, it just... Because you remember up, him from weird. that time in your life. Yeah, yeah. it's just, it's, my brain is like, wow! I think <laughs> that he, the way he writes women makes me think that he probably has a good relationship with his wife. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I mean that. I, I really do. I, I love, I love the female characters. Yeah. And I am hopeful that when they do get to the show, mm-hmm. um, I hope they introduce Naswad in season one. Yeah. Um, and I hope that we, I hope that we get the, I hope that whoever they bring on to screenwrite the show adapts the women as well as they're written in the books mm-hmm. and not just the men. Because that happens sometimes. Especially in like the first season, the women are all just kind of in the background because yeah. they don't have an arc. Yeah. Um. I hope that the, I hope the show is able to really give the women 
that they bring on in, in the, the arcs that they have in the books because I think they're handled really well. Yeah, 100%. Um, Practically Incarnate in the chat says, Roran annoys me. He probably had more moments of supernatural power than Aragon Fair. and seems a genius fighter and tactician. And and I think that that is a valid criticism of the books. We talked about it last week yeah. for sure. Um, you know, Roran's prowess as a warrior kind of comes out of nowhere. Yes. Um, but that is a complaint for Eldest, whereas, like, when we get into Brissinger, it's already established, yeah. so... Yeah, yeah. At this point, it's like, mm. I have no complaints about Brissinger. I do have complaints about Eldest. I think that his rise to being really good is a little silly. Yeah. But now he's... But at the beginning of this book, he's already been really good, so I have to just buy it. Yeah, yeah. You know? We're already at that point. But yeah. I, I, I hear your criticism, and I, I, I don't think you're wrong. It. It's, it's, it is something that is the, strange. The one thing I will say is I think that there are times where Christopher Paolini does a really good job of seeding in that Roran's ideas come from something he experienced in Carvajal. Um, yeah. He's able to draw comparisons and see the world in a really fascinating and way. And so he is, he becomes, part of the reason why he's good at war is because he doesn't view combat from a trained soldier experience, mm -hmm. but from a like problem solving farmer experience. Yeah. And while I do agree that he is very good at fighting for no re apparent reason, like he's never, he, he wields a hammer immediately better than anybody on earth, right? Yeah, yeah. The, the the tactician side, I like that it usually draws on, oh, a soldier wouldn't think about this because a soldier didn't work on a farm. But yeah. I remember, you know what I mean? And I like that that is kind of how he thinks about things. Yeah, or you get those moments of mental clarity where he just, like something clicks in a place and you yeah. can follow his train of thought. Yeah. Um, um His his aunt, Selena, was also like the most evil, intelligent uh, spy lady on the planet. So she might, it might just be like genes. A genetic thing, yeah. Uh, Nick Walker asked if we read Pillars of the Earth. Never um, heard of it. I watched the TV show. There was um, a TV show? Yeah, the Pillars oh. of the Earth was like a mini series, but uh, no, I have not read the book. Um, so Aragon has a sore. They uh, get the Eldunari. Uh, they find out about the Eldunari. They're like, this is how uh, Galbatorix is able to amass more and more and more power over the years. Um, is that he has these Eldunari and he is slowly breaking the mind of each dragon one by one to bring yeah. under his command, which is horrifying. But horrifying. such a cool concept. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Incredibly creative and cool. I love it. Um, and uh, Glader presents Aragon and Sephira with his heart of hearts because it means that they are able to communicate... No matter the uh, the the distance. Yeah. Um, I can go the distance. Joe G, thank you for that super Jay, chat. Thank you so much. Do you remember which came first, your love of the series or the quality of writing female characters? Hmm. Do you think that you liked this so much as a fantasy reader as a child because you were a woman looking for female characters that were actually written well? Maybe. Yeah. I I loved look. I am not a natural ginger. Don't tell anyone. Um, but when I read this series and I was like, oh my God, Arya is this like pale elf with long dark hair. I was like, that's me. Um, and then, you know, and then I read about like Angela and I was like, Angela is so fucking cool. And I did love that Safira was like female. Like, I don't know. It would be, I feel like it's impossible for me to like know for sure. But it definitely didn't hurt. I will say, like, if there's one thing I have to... If, if you had to be like, what is the thing that this book, that this series does that other fantasy doesn't do? I think this has my favorite female characters. Yeah, yeah. Like, I think that in terms of writing them as fully realized three-dimensional people... That don't feel I don't like know a fantasy female. I don't, like, <laughs> I, I think that... I think I will say Chris Paolini writes women better than... Uh, Brand, or, uh, than uh, Robert, Robert Jordan, Jordan does. I'll say that he writes women better than uh, uh, George R. R. Martin does. Um, mm -hmm. Mostly because the characters um, can, you know, have emotional they growth have without agency. being raped. But, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. That, you know, like, I, I, th I think that, like, I there are probably other male authors who can do what Chris Polini's done. I just haven't read them yet. But in There's terms of, like, of fantasy that there. I've read, I think he writes women better than J.K. Rowling does. I agree with that. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, so yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah. The only book that I can really think of uh, in comparison would be uh, the duology Eon and Iona. Mm. Really loves that. Is that a male author? I don't know who oh. wrote it. Okay. I honestly couldn't fucking tell you. I would have to Google it. I read them so long ago. Um, but yeah, Angela is just an absolute favorite regardless of the series. Oh, she's so like, cool. She's, <laughs> yeah. She's, and, and like... 
her aloof but intimate care annoying. for Aragon is very interesting. <laughs> yeah, she's not she aloof and annoying. clearly gives a shit about him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. she doesn't show it in the in the way that you expect. Yeah, for sure. Oh, and she's like fully about to fucking rip him a new asshole over Elva. You know, like she, yeah. like yeah, yeah. She's she's done very well. Yeah. No, I yeah, I think I think he does a great job, and you know, I'm. Yeah. I'm I'm curious what female characters are gonna be in Murtex. I'm sure they're gonna be great. Mm -hmm. Um so we get the two that we kinda the book just kinda ends with two big fights. Yeah, Aragon does go see Sloan. He's a little disappointed in his progress, but you know, Safira's like, he just fucking got here. Like you can't expect him to become a different person overnight. He just walked five hundred miles. And he would walk five hundred um, miles. So yeah, so Aragon and Safira go to uh Feinster. Yep. To help with the siege. And Oramis and Glader, they suit up. They suit up and, and they, they go, go to, to war. To Gilead to help the elves take Gilead. Yes. And uh, one of those goes really well, which is uh, Aragon, Saphira, and Arya break into a palace. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, they, they kill a bunch of people. Yep. And they go and they fight. And as they're getting to the main room, the lady of the palace is like, you've got to stop Lenora. them. They're trying to make a shade. Uh, yeah. And then they do make a shade, and then Aragon passes out because he's been having visions of Glader, and Glader and fucking uh, Ormus are fighting Murtag and Thorn over fight uh, over Gilead. Yeah, Galbatorx like somehow is able to take possession of Murtag's body and like use him as a voice and speak to Ormus and Glader, which is horrifying. Um, uh, it's awesome. Okay, it's so really cool. I said that this is my favorite book in the series. Yes, you have. I will put this book. On the same shelf as Shadow Rising. Yeah, I, I that, would agree. I think that this book is better than almost every Wheel of Time book. And one of the reasons why I think that is because this book sets up stakes very well. And this book is how you set up a villain. Because mm. we see Galbatorix for the first time. He talks to Ormus. And he's so nonchalant. And he's so nice. He doesn't give a fuck. And he's like, I'm not mad anymore. Look, I was mad a hundred years ago, but come on, man. Like, I made mistakes. Every week, people change. Everybody makes mistakes. And then Ormus goes, nah, fuck that. Yeah. And Galbatorx is like, well, it was worth a shot. Fuck you, motherfucker. Die. And then murders the, dra the big dragon. Murders Ormus. The sequence yeah. of that. Yeah. Of setting up Galbatorx for the last book. Ormus has his, like, heroic death. Yeah. It's great. It is the right time to kill Ormus, mm -hmm. narratively. Yeah. Um, having Aragorn experience the emotion of his death through the connection that he has to, uh, not Grandol. Um, Gr Glader? Glader. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so the, the emotion of it is not just, oh, Aragorn hears the story. No, our main character experiences that loss. Which I think is such a strong choice. Brilliant. And well, Galbatorix is the one who did it. Yes, it's Murtag and Thorn's body, mm -hmm. but it is, we finally, in the moment where we introduce the big bad of the series, where he finally makes a physical appearance in the story. He doesn't even appear physically. No, no, it's but you know what I mean. It's fucking like spirit that is like, ah, oh, fuck you, die. But it's him, right? Terrifying. It is, and then the book ends. Yeah. They kill the Shade. Arya becomes Shade Slayer, which is, becomes hilarious in Inheritance because they're both Shade they're Slayer. They're going to be so confused. Um, yes. Varog. I do remember that joke. Yeah. But they, they kill the shade and they, but like Ormus and Glader are dead because Galbatoric showed up and it immediately became awful. Yeah. Is how do you not pick up the next book? How could you possibly read the end of the, and imagine waiting for it. It's the thing that I wanted from, I kept wanting from the wheel of time was for them to set the stake of how bad it would be if Raven showed up, how bad it would be if Demandred showed up. Yeah. And then th that series never did it half as good as this does in like a chapter yeah like a wheel of time has its strengths for sure but i never got to the end of one book and was like dying to have to pick up the next one yeah mm -hmm. um there were moments where i like you know would chew through them but it didn't have the same impact on me for sure um arazu thank you so much for that super chat will you guys also cover the short story collection the fork the witch and the worm it's got so much awesome angela stuff i don't know i don't know that, we, that it's enough for a full book club well yeah we'll see it's not enough for its own full book club i, I want to read think. it we have it. I have only read it once. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know. I've never read it. So I don't maybe know. we'll have time to talk about it in like part two of Murtag. Or maybe in like December we'll do a like maybe, inheritance yeah. wrap up live stream. We'll yeah. just do like a hangout live stream. We'll talk about it as part of that. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, it is, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a good little, little book. 
Uh, um, Nick Walker says Pillars of the Earth would ruin Smut Corner because the author does it themselves. We, we love that. We love I want to read more porn, so uh, we'll, may we'll maybe pick that up. Uh, Akatar? Akatar. Uh, so, no, I will say, I, I, I think that the end of this book is, like, majestically good. I think yes. that it ends on such an incredible high. The action a sequence... A high and a loss. Like, a, like a, a win and a loss. But that is a high to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I And I, I people... People get frustrated because they're like, why do people have to die for nerdy to care? And it's not that they have to die. It's that if you tell me the series is a war series and all of the main characters survive, I get bored. Mm -hmm. But we've seen Ajahad die. We've seen Hrothgar die. The Ormus and Glader. Ormus and Glader are dead. The there's there's more deaths in inheritance, right? This series yeah. is not afraid to show the like personal connection to the death of war. And doing it through Glader's Eldenari here is like it's it's a little bit like we gave you the stone so that you could experience this. It's it's very quickly after that. But the emotional payoff of that choice is so strong yeah. that it becomes this moment that you're like I like <laughs> I was I was depressed, you know, like I was like, oh, like this is it's so hard. sad. It, it it like, it is emotional for sure. And and the moment where Glader's like gone, 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 and he and yeah. suddenly in darkness, and it's uh, harrowing. <laughs> I just think that this is, um, I think that this is one of my favorite books, mm -hmm. and I've made some jokes about this podcast, but I don't actually have any like criticisms for it. Yeah. Uh, um, Roran is maybe a little bit too strong. Maybe but that is who gives in a shit? The emotional setup. revelations of his storyline are so much fun and are so like they they keep you going in such a good the, way. Because the story is not about his strength. If his no, story, it's about his will. Yeah, yeah. If his storyline was about how strong and how many people he killed, then I think him having immediate power would kind of feel cheap. But he has he has this immediate power, which is whether or not it's earned a uh, question mark. But it's not about that. It's about how he feels about it and how he uses his brain, and like and and his relationships with the people around him. And about the fact that he keeps getting on horses when he's not healed. Yeah. I don't know. I just he's I. He's a brave, brave man. I love this book, and I remembered loving it when I was a kid. Like, yeah. I even said last week before we reread it, I was like, I, I don't remember everything that happens, but I know that this is my favorite book in the series. Yeah. And rereading it now, I, I know why. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just the the forging of Brissinger, the the killing of the Razak, the mercy shown to Sloan, the fight with Murtag where Aragon tries so hard to just convince him not to fight. Yeah. The conversation with Arya about her long lost love, the boat that she makes and flies forever. There are so many fantasy things in this book that are unique and done so well. Nargarshvog. Nargarshvog is fucking rad. Yeah. Oric and Oric and Aragon's relationship. Like I could do, we could do book clubs about all of the plot lines in this and talk yeah. for hours because there's depth here and it's the the prose is such a step forward. I I listened to the audiobook so I didn't highlight any um text. Um, so I don't have like lines, but the prose, Christopher Paolini makes a huge leap forward in the quality of his prose between Eldis and this. For sure. And Eldis was a step forward from Aragon, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, Arza brings up the Gilded Lily, which we yeah. didn't talk about, which is cool. The fact that the spirits aren't ghosts, they're like these other beings that no one really understands. Yeah. Um, and, and I love that Aragon is like, how dare sorcerers enslave the spirits, like blah, blah, blah. And Arya's like, well, it's part of their defense mechanism. Yeah. Right, like it's it it's all they, very they make intentional. I mean, <laughs> they make you happy, um, but like, like s just things like that. That like you know, the spirits aren't really that Im important to like furthering the narrative. But mm -hmm. they're such a, a cool, creative world building thing. Um, yeah, the gilded lily. They're like this flower is made out of metal, but like it's still alive, and so it might like procreate. Like, yeah. <laughs> Um, which I, just, I hope Murtag finds one. Mm, yeah. yeah, like, you know, just little, like, touches or sees the boat or something, like, you know, th things like that that really just keep the world alive. I would love if the boat just falls as Murtag around. <laughs> it's already a spine on him. <laughs> that would be very funny. Yeah, it's I don't know. It's got a drone. Um, this, this is the most I've enjoyed reading a book for the show since Shadow Rising. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I put it on that, like, S-tier shelf. I, agree. I think that this is where Christopher Paolini gets to be an S-tier author, in my opinion. And um, Inheritance, 
that there, there's things that I love as much as this book about inheritance. And there's, there's also some things that aren't as my favorite. And I'll be honest about that. Like, I, I think that I, I, re, I need to read it again because I'm, that might've changed. But the last time I remember the ending feeling like a little bit laborious to get through. Oh, okay. Um, I know people have criticisms of the ending, but I think the criticisms I've heard are more the choices that Paolini makes. Um, I remember like... So, yeah. I remember the aftermath of the ending being very long. <laughs> mm. And I wonder if I'll feel that again now. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't remember that. But like... But in this moment, in this moment, I'm really glad to have read this book again because I think it is very, very, very good. Yes. Yes, I yes do. it is. Yeah, I just yeah. I think it is I think it is the it's a top shelf book. Yeah. Um I actually um I forgot in the Discord I did ask people if they wanted to ask any questions. Oh great. And there was there was there was a couple. There was a couple. By the way, like I said at the beginning of the podcast, we are um going to get our book signed by Pellini on Thursday. So if there's any questions you are dying to ask, we'll see if we can't slip them in there um when we meet him. Uh, where is, there it is, Inheritance Cycle. So, uh, a couple questions here. Uh, Shafika asks, uh, what do you think about how Aragon handled Sloan? I feel like we already discussed that pretty well. I think he did a great job. Yeah. I think it, I think it is one of the, like, moral moments that elevates this series above just being a, like, uh, hack and slash, um, dragon adventure. Yeah, I agree. Do you think that Roran was right to disobey orders? Yeah, of course. I think if you save Fuck lives... I think if you save lives, that is always the the correct option. And I, but uh, it's like goes into the wheel of time, like Gia Tosta. You have to t accept the punishment. Yeah, and he does. And he does. But I'm also I would never be in the military because I'm like no, I have a better idea than you. <laughs> yeah. Um. What do you think of the banishing of the names? We didn't talk about the banishing of the names. I had forgotten about this. This it's, was one of the elements of this book that I had forgotten about in the intervening years. Well, and it's because it doesn't actually impact the immediate narrative, but, but it, it is, is so horrifying. Oh my god! The and again the horror elements, yeah. like the 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 fact that the dragons can't like use pronouns. Yeah. Like I like this thing. It's like well, no, you can't do that because it informs it drives who you them are. Crazy. Yeah. I I love that is, but it's another element that like I there's nothing else in fantasy that I've read that compares to that, right? Yeah, agree. That's where like the like plagiarism and I think that a lot of this podcast has been me pushing back on a narrative about Christopher Paolini that I think is unfair. I agree. In that I think the series is more unique than people want to give it credit for because, because it's first... easy to point at some influences, mm -hmm. but even the first book does some very unique things with relationships between characters, I you agree. know what I mean? I and agree so 100%. I think, um, I think that the, I think the banishing of the names is one of those ideas that is like such a deep seated horror idea that doesn't seem horrifying until you really ponder the ramifications of every day having no ability to be a unique person, to have anything that is yours. Mm hmm even yourself. Like, even you are no longer your own. Yeah. And for the dragons, it is extra horrifying because they have a connection to someone who so deeply is able to be themselves. And so they're able to even, like, at least if they didn't have that bond, they would be alone in their experience. But they have this constant tether to someone who can do all of that thing, all of those things, and is their own person and does have a name. Yeah. And so all, their entire existence is having this issue that they can feel somebody else doesn't have. Yeah. But they, they can't even put a name on because they can't say, I am struggling. Mm -hmm. They can't say, I am hurting. They can't say, my my wing is injured. Yeah. They can't, I like chicken. They can't say anything, right? Yeah. And it is... Um, it's rough. Yeah. It's, it's incredibly creative and horrifying in a way that's more subtle than like, you know, like yeah. laughing men who are dying or whatever it is. But or it's like still weaved, horrifying. weaved magic and all the dragons died. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like... That, yeah. That's the easy version, but this is the like, oh, we, we did the worst thing possible. They took away their individuality. Yeah. 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 Um, Arzu asks, how do you feel about the structure of the book? Aragon's story seems to be a collection of many arcs in a whole arc. Do you like it better than seemingly having no arc in Eldest? I don't know that I agree with that. Um, I don't agree with that. I think that his arc is very clear. Uh, he is tying every... He has to. He has to get better. Um, but he has 
ties to the Varden. And I think that, like, the story of this is Aragon trying to satisfy his pledges so that he can create space for himself to become who he needs to be in the fight. Okay, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting way to look and at so, it. And so, like, because his... I see I see what Arzu says. You know, he's like, oh, he's got to go pick the new king, and then he's got to deal with Sloane. But I think you're you're right. That's part of an overarching thing. But that isn't. He, he doesn't have to go pick the new king. He has prom. He has made promises to Nazwada. The, the the arc of Aragon's story in this book is that he has made no. He's made promises to many people. Mm-hmm. He he's made. He, Book two is about, um, book one is about Aragon finding his way into this world and getting ties to all of these people because of it. And his mistakes leading to him owing people things. Mm -hmm. Then book two is about him becoming the person who can pay back those promises, right? Yeah. It's about him growing into a man that can satisfy the the requests placed upon him. And And that's why I think he has less of an arc there because it's more about him becoming something that he needs to be for other things. This book is where all of those promises hit home at the same time. Right. His promise to avenge Katrina, to get Katrina back with Roran. His promise to Nasuada to help the Varden grow their alliance as big as possible. Yeah. His promise to Oric to be a brother to him and his a fealty. A member of Dirk Jedem. And so he is still not strong enough to take on Galbatorix and that is his goal. Yeah. But he has to satisfy all of his promises before he can do that. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think that the arc of getting to Ormus, he earns the information that he gets from Ormus. He earns learning that Brahmus is father. And this is, you guys know I like story structure. This is good story structure. He has to earn that information. He has mm-hmm. to, it would be cheap if Ormus just gave it to him. And he earns it by, he satisfies his promise to Roran. And yeah. he shows up for Oren. He satisfies his promise to Nasuada. He is a good Dirk Dur- and Green Tenta. And Alva as well. He satisfies all of his promises to everybody. And he goes and he uses the skills that he learned in Eldest to fully realize the things that he said he was going to do to everybody that he has made promises to. Yeah. And then in that moment, he's able to go to Dwaldin Varden and get the information that will help him beat Galbatorix, right? Mm -hmm. You, the the arc of this book is, yes, there are many arcs, but all of them are tied into the idea that Aragon has to make right by everybody before he is allowed to ascend to be the character that can beat the final boss. Yeah, yeah. And I so, hear you. Th- and that's why he's I love it. He's got a lot it. of mini quests that he's got to get off the list before he's high enough level to. <laughs> but all of those mini quests are set up in previous books. Absolutely. None of yeah, them yeah, come yeah. in this book. Yeah. They yeah. are all set up by the actions he's made in previous books and the actions other characters have made in previous books. Yeah. And they are payoffs to the things that we knew he was eventually going to have to do. Yeah. It's why I love this book. It's why I think it is so well written, is because his arc is so clear to me. Yeah. He earns the information he gets at the end. Because he does pr- what he promised he was going to do to everybody. Yep. And he does end up satisfying everybody, but he does it in a way that leaves the Varden open to a lot more death than if he had been there with them. And so people die in order for him to have that information. But it's earned. And I think that he, I, I think that Runan building him a sword is earned by his actions and his behavior. Yeah, Runan wouldn't like try and do a weird ring around the rosy with her oath so she didn't think that he was worth it, right? Yeah, no, I, I think it's brilliant. I think this book is very good. Yeah. Um, can I ask, how do you think reading The Wheel of Time for two years influenced rereading The Inheritance Cycle? Um, I think that the influence has been, honestly, to 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 learn to read things uh, with a more analytical lens. Because when mm, okay. I first read these books, I read them for a pleasure and I powered through them. I would say I would just read and read and read and read and read and just like enjoy myself. And you know, I lost the 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 free time to be able to and do that to to be able to do that, which book club has brought back. And I I love. I love going through a series like that, which which taught me a lot and introduced me to other fantasy things. Obviously, there's things that I'm like, oh, I see the influence, like Garrow and uh, Tam on like being pulled back to the village. Um, you know, moments like that, which are clearly influenced um, from the Wheel of Time. But it, my my major influence has been learning how to read and taking the pauses to analyze and break things down for better or for worse I think for the wheel of time because of the slog and certain books like it felt very negative because we had to stop Mm -hmm. and we had to talk about it and we had to think about it and we had to discuss why we felt the ways that we did yeah but it has taught me so much 
that revisiting these books that I love, I'm now able to really understand why I loved them so much. And mm. that uh, that's a gift. Like, that, that is very special to me. Yeah. I think that one of the things that I think stands out so much to me about Paolini's writing, particularly in this book, mm -hmm. compared to The Wheel of Time, is... But not the Brandon Sanderson Wheel of Time. I'm talking about pre-Brando Sando. Robert Jordan Wheel of Time. Is the way in which Paolini gets into it. And, like, I like I do think that this book would have been three books in the Wheel of Time because we would have had conversations for three days about what we're going to do. We would have had to take, like, 200 pages to convince Nazwada to let us go to fight yeah. the Razak. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that, like, in every single town, we would have stopped and analyzed what their clothing was. And, like, I think that there are going to be people who would have preferred that. And I, sure, yeah. I don't. Yeah. I think that um, coming from Wheel of Time to this series, the thing that stands out most to me is that I really like good pacing. The pacing. And I think that the, these books are really well paced. Absolutely. And um, we're not wasting any time, but it also never feels rushed. But I will say that I uh, I am appreciating the prose of these books more the more they get closer to, but I never quite reach Robert Jordan. I think Robert Jordan's prose is kind of unmatched, right? Yeah. He, he, the way he uses words to describe things is really stunning and incredible. Yeah. Um, but I, I, and I've been saying this since the beginning, like I think that his pacing is not great. And I think that this, that, that stands out to me now is that like after two years of reading the same kind of pacing, it is so nice to break that up with something that is paced in a, in, in a way that I enjoy more. Yeah. If yeah. that's fair. For sure. Uh, Shavika asks, uh, what do you think about the idea of a true name and how it can be used to control someone and the idea that the name can change as a person changes? I think a true name is a dumb thing if it can't change. Uh, that And that's, that's I agree. I think, it, same, I think, I think this concept only works to me because it changes as you change. And yeah. that your true name isn't some mystical thing you're born with, but is the root of your essence, but that your essence isn't fixed. And I, that is why it works so well for me. Yeah. Um, Nick... They're, the, the dragons are not slaves. They have yeah, they're not. Fr free will to do whatever they want. I mean, they are under Galvatorix, which is why sure. they're fighting to stop him. Yeah, like the Eldunari have been enslaved by Galvatorix, and obviously Shrukin was enslaved by Galvatorix. But like, Aragon has to literally flee down a tunnel Sephira can't get in, or else she's going to grab him and fly away with him. Yeah, yeah. The dragons do not lose their free will because they're bonded to a rider. Um, yeah, just, Shrukin is the only... They have an yeah. understanding. And Thorn. Shrukin and Thorn are the only two that are Thorn technically... Thorn is bonded is by, by, because of his true name. Yeah. Yeah, yeah like, the, there, there's a, there is a lot of slavery in these books, but Aragon frees the slaves. Exactly. <laughs> Aragon hates slavery, and spoiler... Sorry, this is a spoiler for Inheritance. Uh, sorry, uh, but Aragon does free the slaves. Uh, yeah, with slavery, bad. Um, those Was that are, all the questions? Yeah, those are the questions from the Discord. I have a question for you. Uh-huh. What is your, if there was a character that we don't get a POV from, uh huh, except Arya, because I feel like the, the easy answer to this is Arya. Okay. Other than Arya, what character would you like a POV from that we don't get one from? Because I think the easy answer is Arya, because we do spend a lot of time with her, but we don't get, I don't think we ever get her POV. I... Because I was thinking about this today and I have an answer that I think is interesting, but... This might be really dark. <laughs> but I have always thought that a chapter from Shuriken's POV would oh, be fuck. interesting. I would love that. Yeah, it would yeah. be heartbreaking. Because Shuriken is truly the, the, the biggest tragedy of these books. Yeah. And there's a lot of tragedies in Allegasia, but Shrukin's entire life is hell. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah. That's one where I'm like, oh man, I, I just feel so bad. But I think that's the first answer that comes to mind. Wow. So. That's so much darker. What would yours be? I like, um, Shafika says Angela. Angela's POV would be insane. Oh yeah. I, I would can't, love that. I, I can't remember if we get her POV. I don't believe so. I don't think so. I think the only POV characters in the next book are Murtag, Nasuada, Aragon, Roran, Sephira. Sephira. I think so. I think so. Do we so. get a Thorn POV? Maybe. 
May- maybe? I, I don't can't. remember. I don't remember. Guys, it has been a moment. I bet we do in Murtag. I'm sure we do in Murtag. But who is your answer? Um. Oh, Sloane. <laughs> oh. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I Like, if I could have had a chapter, just, just because of how good I think that narrative is, I would have loved to have spent some time in his head while he was trying to get... I would have loved to have seen him get to Dwendal Varden in his, from his point of view. <laughs> what? You said Dwendal Varden and it made me laugh. <laughs> I love you. What is it? Do well then. Do well then, Varden. You just you you uh, con- I know. conjoined it. I'm it's fine. dyslexic. Uh, Breezy actually asked us if we are going to read Paolini's other book, To Sleep in a Sea of Stars. Um, I didn't know about this until yesterday. You brought it up. Oh, um, you didn't, I didn't know. I did not know he wrote a sci-fi series. So I, oh. I, I yeah, very we want to read it. Uh, I, I haven't read it yet. I kind of would love to book club it. Um, because we haven't read that series. You could do it over Christmas instead of no. I I want to do it properly. Um, uh, we're not going to do fourth. Oh, no. Not right now. Um, oh, no. Maybe later. Okay. We're going to save it. Because uh, okay. of things. Um, okay. I, I, and that I don't know about yet. We're, I don't know what we're going to do over so, Christmas. Okay, okay. Question mark, question mark. Yeah, I question mean, mark. to sleep in a sea of stars, if we we could do three weeks through December, split it into three. Isn't there like four books in that series? No. Oh, it's just one book? Yeah. Oh! But it's not done, like the series isn't done yet, so. That might be fun before we start... Cosmere in January. Ooh, that could be fun. We're here for Christmas. What do you guys think? Would you want to do a book club on it? Because we don't want to start Cosmere until January. We want yeah, to start that the next year. Yeah, new series. We don't want to do it over Christmas. We want to do something a little bit easier, just lighter. More self-contained. But if it's not done, I don't know. I Maybe we'll wait for, like, the next book to come out. I mean, here's the thing. It's going to be years and years before it's finished. Like, it's, it's, it's a larger... It, like his fractal verse is like a uh, is going to be several books. Okay, well let's look into it and let's make let's make a decision off stream. Okay. Um, for now though, uh, Clarus and I are gonna do high low. Mm-hmm. This is tough because I feel like we both we know what our highs are, but um, and I don't know that I can pick a low in this book. Here, I'll pick a different high than you. Uh, so this is a thing where uh, at my childhood dinner table, we would do high-low because my family was blended. I have uh, two stepsisters and a half-brother. And to try and bring us all together and, you know, forge that love that we now share and that I would die for any of my siblings, um, we would do high-low every dinner. We would celebrate each other's highs, commiserate over each other's lows, and uh, brought us closer together. Clark's going to do her high, I do my low. She does her low, I do my high. That way we compliment sandwich this bitch and she gets to go first. So, Clarus, what was your high from the novel Brissinger by Christopher Pallini? I feel like we both have the same high, and I feel like it is probably a lot of people's high. So, should I um, should I try and pick a different no, one? No, no, no. Here's what I'm going to say. You cannot choose the forging of Brissinger. Rude. Neither of us can. No, no, I'm saying that... Uh, okay, okay. That is, the, that is the best moment in the book. So, okay. neither of us gets it. We have to come up with a high that isn't... It, that's like Hall of Fame. I think that's what they do on... um geek history lesson when they do like top five lists there's like things that they take out because it's like of course or, okay was it that or i don't know i can't remember which show did that okay then if i'm not picking the forging of the sword yeah i am picking uh brahm's memory for aragon oh okay yeah cool i love that yeah i think it's i think it's i think it's beautiful not what i would have chosen but i, I love that you chose that yeah yeah i think it's it's powerful and it's so earned like you said uh what's your love I don't know. I know, right? I don't I don't have one really. Like at all. I really like this book. I don't really have any complaints. I don't have there's not there's no chapters that I dislike. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I think maybe if I were to pick a low it seems really obvious that the people tried to assassinate Aragon was a swelled in Rakanuin. Yeah, but yes, it's but it, obvious but, but it they makes s- sense. No, but here's the thing. It's obvious, but they still go through the process of getting the evidence. Like, there's no point where they don't know that oh, it's them. yeah. It's not an easy win. They still have to go through the due process. But that's what I love about it, yeah. is that, like, everyone knows that it's them. No right. one there is being like, nah, maybe it isn't. Everyone knows that it's them, but they, they have to go through the legal process. Even that, I love, right? And so, I don't... I have to pick something. But this is the this is the hardest it's ever been for me to pick a low in two years of book club. <laughs> I, I don't dislike anything about this book. I really don't. I, I don't like, either. Like, maybe Roran is a little too strong. Sure. Sure. All right. But I like all of his scenes, so I don't so know. So then what's your high? 
Um, if I can't pick, it's, I don't know. It's, I, I'm going to say two just because I can't really choose between these two. Okay, fine. But it's either um, Oryx. Um, Crowning? Yeah, Oryx Coronation or, or uh, Glader Enormous's death. Um, for two, like the two opposites of the spectrum, one of the coolest things and one of the saddest things, Yeah. but both of them hit me emotionally exactly the way that I want Yeah. and both do so much good for the series as a whole in terms of being beats. Um, yeah, I, I, but like, I don't, I don't really have a low, but I have so many highs. I love this book. I, it, it is, it is far and away the reason why I love this series to this day. And it is, I don't know, it just, it is that book for me. It is. So dang good. It gets it right on every, in every narrative, in every storyline, in every location. It does the, like, more interesting choice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the Ooh, Sloan little... choice is the more interesting choice, narratively. And I love yes. that. Uh, honorable mention, actually. Uh, the, the dwarf lady who is, like, flirting with Aragon has this moment where she is the last one to cast her vote for Auric. Yeah. Her, her, no, wait. Her speech is fucking great, too. Yeah. She's like, I... Think, Are we cowards? Yeah. A race <laughs> as old and as powerful as mm -hmm. ours, we're just going to sit here and let other people decide the fate of the world? Not on my fucking yeah. watch. Yeah. And I just fuck it. I, like, she's, like, s barely a character in the books, but she has so much personality. Again... The women are written really well. Female, he gets he he allows his female characters to have just as much agency as his male characters. Absolutely. And I I will always credit Paulini for that in this yeah, book. Yeah. He he does a really good job. That speech is fucking rad. Yeah. Oh, it's great. Trying to remember your low and shadow rising. I think that wasn't it that um wasn't it the Elaine Tom wasn't it the Elaine Tom lap sitting stuff? Oh, was that Shadow Rising? Because if so, it was definitely that. I think that. No. Because that might be book five. Yeah, no, no, no. Because it's on, they're in Tenchiko with Tom. I think it is. I think my low in Shadow Rising was Elaine and Tom's relationship. Because I love Shadow Rising. I think Shadow Rising is an incredible book. Yeah. But the first half of that book, that, that, that book has some of, that book has the best ending in The Wheel of Time. It has some of the best moments in the Wheel of Time, the best but there's chaos, still some yeah. like there's some weird there's some weird shit in there. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think yeah, I think, think it might be, be the Elaine Tom. Well, because it's not the circus stuff. That is... Um... Every Wheel of Time book has at least one super fucking weird thing. Yeah. <laughs> Nick Walker okay. says, would y'all fuck a dragon? I don't know if I would survive it, so no. Uh, I would. All right. I'm into weird shit. <laughs> I'm... At dragon.com. But like, if it's sentient and can consent, if it's an okay. animal, if it's bestial, no. Uh, I have no interest in that. Um, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But like... I would fuck an alien. <laughs> if the alien was down... I'm really turned on by aliens for some reason, so... I think it's because I watched Star, Star Wars. Wars so much as a child. Star Wars will do that to you. Those yeah. Twi'leks, man. Yeah, rude. And the the green alien from um, Star Lucas, Trek. George no, nah, he knew what he was doing. No, it was Star Trek 2. Yeah, they Star knew what Trek they were well. doing. Rude. I, uh... Rude. I watch weird porn. Uh, if you like this video, like and subscribe to the channel. If you don't, hit the dislike button. Leave mean <laughs> comments down below because the algorithm god is hungry and we must feed her. Uh, if you have watched any of my Baldur's Gate playthroughs, you know I will fuck things that are not human. Uh, Great. <laughs> the algorithm goddess of this episode is... I'm not even going to give it to you. I'm sorry. It's Naswata. The, yeah. the, the trial of the, the long knives is too rad. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, you don't go through that and not earn goddess of the week. Um, if you want to follow us around the internet, you can. I'm at Nerdy Nightly. I'm at Clars Polaris. Leave us five star review on Amazon. Do all of those dang things. <laughs> uh, come back if you like the Inheritance Cycle this weekend, maybe. We're hoping there's going to be something special for you. Um, but we can't talk about it yet. So, yeah, join the Discord if, if you want to be the first to know. Yes. Uh, join the, the patrons. We'll get that video first. So, um, True, yeah. If you are a member of our Patreon, look out for something special. Um, I'm going to try and get that up on Patreon as fast as I can. For sure. Uh, all right. Hello, Sir Jim. Goodbye, Sir Jim. Nerdy Kirk Wordy. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I'm changing my name online. Please don't. To Nerdy Kirk Wordy. Yeah, I love you're... that. Thanks, chat, for Nerdy a... Kirk Wordy. Thanks for a book club. <laughs> Smart Corner. Clarus, where are you adding sex into this? That isn't the orgy scene that <laughs> happens I in mean, the woods. Yeah, what are you... What? Yeah. Um, the Razak trying to, like, figure out how to bone without it being incest is a scene that I want. I mean, it is incest. You can't bone without it being incest. Well, are the leather blocker related to each other? They might be. They might not be siblings. 
They might yeah, be but the from... leather blocka had their eggs, which means that the two Razak are their but children, we don't so they're either fucking that... siblings okay. or parents. But we don't know that the le... we don't know that the Razak are have gender. Okay. So they might self fuck uh, themselves. They might, yeah. Okay, maybe. Yeah, sure, maybe. So then they would just have sex for pleasure. Sure. They just can't have sex with their kids because don't have sex with your own children. But like. <laughs> But don't. I I think it's fair to say don't do that. Don't do that. People do. It's weird. It's a very Sweet popular. Sweet home Alabama. Very popular porn category. I can I can make that joke. My mom was born in Alabama. Yeah, you're allowed. Um. um yeah, I don't know. I I bet you like the five minutes that Rory is home for his wedding. Uh, him and Katrina get real freaky. Oh, they get freaky all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Jit Gilwig, uh, there's no orgies in this book. It's in Eldest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's two orgies in Eldest, but yeah, uh, they're, yeah. they're not in this book. They're not described in detail, but um, the pheromones are strong. The pheromones. All, all the creatures of the forest bone down. Everyone is boning Bloodgarm. Um, who else? What? Oh, Bloodgarm is definitely fucking his way through the bar. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's, that's about it. That's all I got. Hmm. Do you think Saphira masturbates? I don't know. Can she reach? With her tongue. Maybe. M- maybe. I don't know. <laughs> uh, it brings up the question of like, if you could suck your own cock, would you? You know. I'm. I know some people would. I would. But um. You're not willing to, you know, contort and have your ribs removed. Have you for that? seen my body? There's no way that that. There's no. There's. No, it's not a flexibility issue. Oh no! Me. It's it that is there a is body issue. like ribs and organs in the way. No, that's a, that doesn't impact it. My dick is also just not long enough. <laughs> it's have to come to like here. I'm not that unflexible. Anyway, this has been fun. Uh, Christopher Paulini, if you watched this and got to this point, sorry. Sorry. Someone should have warned you about the end of our show. Uh, Arzu, can dragons masturbate? It's a good question. We're going to ask Christopher Paolini on Thursday at his event at Indigo while the entire crowd is sitting there. We're going to go up to the mic and be like, uh, yeah, so, uh, would love to ask you about, um, the books, but, uh, the real question today is, uh, yeah, can, does Sephira masturbate? Yeah, can the dragons, uh, diddle themselves? <laughs> why, why, Get what do here. we do? Bye. Uh, bye, guys. Do something nerdy tonight. 